This is the Wapak Area School District Board of Education meeting. Second, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. We'll now move to the portion of the agenda that is open for public comment. If anyone here wishes to address the board, this would be the time to do so. Does that include teachers? Mm-hmm. Part of the public, yes. I didn't know where we were on the agenda. Uh, Greg Beagle will attack middle school band director. Um, um, just uh, wanted to give this to you as a reference. No more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. All right, um, I gave um, representatives up here a, a, a sheet of paper that says why the need for two middle school band directors. Okay, um, I believe Dr. Nian uh, said it was okay to speak on behalf of your department. So on behalf of Mrs. Rogney and myself and Mrs. Leader, um, some notes I jotted down, um, why the need for two band directors? First of all, we implore the board not to split up the middle school band position again. I'm gonna be retiring after this year. Many of you know that. Um, in 1994, I was hired as the first halftime band director. Enrollment in band goes up. Past administrations cut the halftime band director. Now we have 75% in the middle, 75% of kids in the middle school in band. Rumor has it that we want to split it up again. Because I'm retiring at the end of this year, why not take advantage of the opening and make it a part-time middle school and part-time chain or charter uh, music class? We need two full-time band directors to fulfill the needs of those middle school students. If you break up my position after this year, you'll not, you will see the eventual demise or, or programs that are not adequate of our middle school or high school programs or programs that are substandard. Is there any way to get a music teacher to the charter or chain without taking away from our quality of our middle school program? And I have to ask this, when I sent my letter of resignation in September, my position still has not been filled or posted, excuse me, posted. Not sure why. And that's but the gist of what I have to say, there's much more on here why the need for two band directors, if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to give you a copy of that. Okay. Jane? Mm -hmm. Laurel? Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate, Appreciate it very, very much. Anyone else I would like to address the board? Okay, with that, then we will move to <coughs> the approval of past meeting minutes. We'll start with the February 14 regular <coughs> board meeting. So moved for approval. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Opposed? Thank you. February 14th special board meeting. So moved. Motion second. to approve. Second. Any second? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. The March 1 special board meeting? So move for approval. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. And finally, the March 6 special board meeting? Move for approval. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. We'll move on to communications with the district administrator's report. Thank you, President Johnson. Well, March arrived like a lion this year as we learned the snow and ice build up on the gymnasium roof had caused the truss system to bend. The snow load has been removed and the area has been deemed safe for use again. The administration is working with the structural engineer, truss manufacturer, and maintenance department to create a timeline for repairs. The Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction has notified the district that the results-driven accountability procedural compliance self-assessment will begin in the 2019-2020 school year. This annual performance report requires districts to document performance on 17 indicators as required by the Office of Special Education Programming. The assessment will measure compliance in many areas of special ed programming. Comet Field was recognized by the American Sports Builders Association with the Distinguished Single Field Facility Award on December 3rd, 2018. Special thanks go to Rettler Corporation and John Kinnear for their work on the project and submission of the field for recognition. The recognition signage will be displayed in the high school. And just so I can get a sense of what this looks like. It's kind of a two part here. So, there we go. Yeah, very nice. District representatives have been asked to participate in the Wapaka Public Library strategic planning process. Both entities are focused on the importance of literacy and we are happy to support our community partners. Congratulations to Miles Wenberg, Lucas Soto, Tyler Smith, and Rowan Thompson for finishing 24th out of 218 teams in the State Battle of the Books competition for grades four through six. Way to go, guys. Congratulations to Charlie Potts for receiving the President's Volunteer Service Award, Honorable Mention, for his dedication to community and volunteer service work. Nice job, Charlie. As we approach the Ides of March, I hope everyone can let their guard down and enjoy the warm weather and time off with loved ones over spring break. A little literary humor there. <laughs> More historical scenes are actually. <laughs> so concludes my report. Very good. Uh, a couple of quick questions. One on the trust repairs, have we determined that that will be covered by insurance? Correct. Yes. Okay. And do we have any feel as to what the how extensive any damage may have been? In our I believe today. we had no weld breaks, so uh, it looks like it's just uh, add on to the trust structure that's there. So we really didn't have any. Um, so it wasn't as severe as uh, projected. Can I ask a question of one of our people in the audience? Maybe sure. there's a little background. Um, Karen, uh, as long as we're talking about the gym, what kind of a disruption did you actually experience with that? Well, you? we walked in and I noticed right away that the curtains were hanging down on the floor, so we kind of thought, this isn't normal. So <laughs> <laughs> we brought it to the administration's attention and right away they just removed us from the gym, which we were able still to use the multi-purpose room and the weight room which was nice, and also we have nice set of skis, like numerous sets of skis, and snowshoes. So we're still able to get outside with our kids. So we just conducted business, but just did some different things with the kids, so we still had class. So it worked out well, I mean, actually, and it was kind of nice, because some kids were to take snowshoeing and skiing, which don't, normally so we were able to get them out there and experience that good thank you okay thank you um anything else i got any of our other facilities of concern with regard to the amount of weight that we've experienced on the structures okay very good just as a note uh following your um, report I will let everyone know that the fields division in which uh, Wapaka was recognized, I think the first place facility was a new field for the Atlanta Falcons. So we did lose out to them uh, for single field, but uh, again, a very significant yeah. accomplishment to be recognized nationally. Okay, uh, school board reports on meetings attended. Are there any meetings that anyone wishes to 
uh, report on at this time. A school visit. Okay, I we'll, was. We'll, uh, get, we'll get to that. Oh, well, I thought. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I gave the uh, report the last time I went to the Dells for the uh, human resources and legal, but I pretty much told, uh, and that's all in the minutes uh, w w when we had our special meeting last week. So I don't really have anything more to say. All of that material, however, I will leave with uh, the superintendent as it uh, deals with um, kind of the latest update in legal and, and uh, ideas and whatnot. But for right now, um, that's really all I have. I attended the Living Room Walk Act over the meeting that was held on February 15th and the beginning again in March, um, in part because there is Theta Care community interest in the community garden, as well as the CDC potential for a community garden, and perhaps others, other branches. It's a really interesting group of people and lots of good things. Mark, would you like to start us out with school visits? School visits. Okay, so I was, I was at the uh, the chain school, and I, I can probably say I'm the probably the only one in this building who's ever uh, slept overnight in that building. <laughs> it's back in 1969 when it was when it was a seminary, and my parents thought it was a good thing uh, if I would explore being a Catholic priest. <laughs> uh, so I spent a week, and, and going okay, back right. there, you know, okay. and I, and when I was technology coordinator back in the 90s, um, I used to go to all the buildings, and I was out there uh, uh, back then, and I haven't really been out there since. And um, it, was, it was an amazing um, educational environment, uh, not what I expected. I really felt that, um, it was just a just a warm, inviting environment. Um, but I did notice uh, one thing that I was just a little uh, uh, made aware of today. The roof was leaking in three different places, and they have one of those inversion roofs where it comes down into the middle, and I don't know why they make roofs like that in Wisconsin, but um, apparently they've had some problems the last couple of years. They've had rubbers there to look at it, and. Uh, it, they sprung two new leaks last night, so I think that's something that we're going to have to look at down the road here. I'm not sure exactly what it's going to take uh, to fix that. But, um, and then I saw bowling for health, um, health, healthy snacks today. So the kids were to set up uh, their pins, and they had to strike. And at first, no one got a strike for the longest time. And then... I observed about 10 strikes after that, and every time they get a strike, they get an either a healthy snack or a piece of fruit to take home. And I can tell you, as the, as the class went on, there were more strikes and more strikes, you know, and uh, it, was, it was fun to see those kids do that. So, that was my experience at the chain, so. Mr. Ayako, will you make note of, uh, if it hasn't been reported, I'm sure there's a follow-up on the roofs. It's already good, it's a good project. Very good. Other reports on school visits? Well, I did a school visit to the Wapaka High School. I don't know if you know where that's at, but <laughs> it was quite interesting. I went down to see Miss Lehman and give her a little bit of a hard time because she's retiring. But as all I saw was Dale felt kind of disappointing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, and then I talked with Colleen Truman for quite a while. And Joe Jansen, I met in the hall and talked to him for quite a while. I went and talked to Mark Kreshek about the band and the situation at the middle school. And I ended it off having a nice visit with Mr. It was a very good afternoon. Very good. you got anything? Yeah, um, I was on the docket to go visit the alternative school, so I went today also and spent about an hour. Um, it was a it was a great visit. It, it, the timing was great. Um, Mr. Peters happened to be there at that time as um, Ms. Bloomberg, and so we were able to chat about um, how the program's going this year, and they have several more students this year than last year. And there were five students in there, um, and I was able to just sit down and talk with them for about 45 minutes and just talk about the program and how they like the program and the benefits of the program and um, how it's really, really helping them. And um, it was very heartening to hear how something specialized like that will help young people 
meet their needs and reach their goals. And there was a young man who was so proud of himself because he's going to graduate this year, and he said if it wouldn't have been for this program, specifically those two teachers, um, he wouldn't have been able to do it. So um, it was great. And they asked me a little about the school board and what we do, and um, so it was a really, really nice visit. And you know, having done this for quite a few years, and having, in the past, we visited over when it was located um, downtown in Waupaca, and now it's been here for several years, and we talked about the difference in two locations, and there's pros and cons for both. But um, the ability of the students to drop in for, spend an hour or two or whatever in that classroom, um, I think it's a real benefit to have it here. So anyway, it was a great visit. I'm always grateful for the opportunity. Well, I'll go next as long as uh, I'm right next to Betty here. Um, <clears throat> I went out the sunny day to look at our 4K program and walked through the building. It was, it was really fun. Uh, it's always interesting to see <clears throat> the, uh, the boards, the posters, the uh, artwork that they, they have up and some uh, interesting things. Um, the uh, students in our 4K, this was in the morning, our morning class um, actually went down and, and met with the other uh, four-year-olds who normally come in the uh, afternoon. We have two classes there. Uh, both of them have 17 students each. And uh, I, I, as I found out, they were, they're pretty equally uh, distributed between genders. Um, and <clears throat> the two classes were getting together because they have a concert coming up um, shortly after our spring break and they were practicing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were all able to sing, uh, she's coming around the mountain when she comes, and I was able to join in. She was driving six white horses when she comes. We were able to do all of that together and uh, had, a, had a great time. So it's always fun to go out and see what they're doing, but um, it was a really nice atmosphere. Kids are great. They're very excited about the concert coming up. And um, so it, it was fun. I visited with the teachers a little bit, the aides, and uh, had, had a real nice visit. And, uh, sunny day. Um, I guess I, I was at the middle school uh, yesterday, actually. Uh, the teachers union had a meeting that uh, um, Steve and I and, and Dale Felt were there. And um, it was great to see a whole classroom packed full of teachers uh, for a teachers union meeting. Um, it seems like, uh, like the union is doing well, and, and that was encouraging to see. attended um, the Chain Exploration Center's musical that was held the end of last month. It's, everything blends together. We are monsters. And every student in the CDC participated. It had dance, it had song, it had <coughs> love and drama, <laughs> and um, a moral to the story that people should not be judged by their appearance. The kids did such a wonderful job. They, they worked on um, Karen Hatfield worked with them in practice, even as we were having just that series of snow days where people couldn't get to school. Um, it was it was really delightful. And the next day, they were all coming up to Miss Hatfield and asking if they could do another one this year. <laughs> so, but uh, it was it was really fun. I had seen a number of the children in other settings. And some of them just came to life in ways that I haven't seen before. When they got up on stage and did their dances and sang their songs. Very, very nice. Good. Uh, I attended the reality store that they did for the seniors. Uh, it was held down at the Henderson Center due to our gymnasium being closed at that point in time. Uh, really want to thank all, thank all the people and businesses from the community that <coughs> participated. Uh, I don't know how many there necessarily were. Ms. Herb, do you recall roughly how many businesses may have participated? I've got to think there are at least 12, something like that, in addition to school personnel that helped with it. Anyway, it was, uh, they did it in a number of shifts, but it was uh, uh, very, actually fun to watch. Uh, as kids were going from station to station trying to figure out uh, how they were going to get housing and what kind of housing that might be, how they would insure it, whether or not they could afford to get a car. Um, we 
you would roll the dice to find out uh, how large of a family you had. Uh, I'm not sure if the message was necessarily sent that you're better off with a good paying job and no kids, uh, because there was one of the students that was very delighted that that was her status, uh, and a young man who had four children and uh, kind of a moderate income who uh, really could not go to the entertainment desk uh, to get anything fun there. So, uh, but I think it was an eye opener for our students. Uh, in addition to the businesses, there were personnel from the police department there. Um, so you would go over and find out if you got a speeding citation, what that would call you, think, or cost you, things like that. And uh, just a real good interaction. I think a little bit of an eye opener for, for some of the students. And I think it brings us back to, uh, in some cases, uh, we may be of greater benefit to our students if we uh, provide them a little more fi financial literacy than perhaps we are today um, to prepare them for not only the reality store, but reality period. So um, anyway, thank you. Uh, we will go from that to Upcoming meetings and other activities. Dr. Neal, if you'd like to run us through those. Sure, absolutely. April 2nd is uh, election day. Make sure you get out and vote. Uh, April 9th is the regular board meeting here in the community room at 515. Okay. Moving on to recognition. Last week was National School <coughs> Breakfast Week. So I think I saw Dar walk in earlier. So special thanks to uh, Dar and all her staff for ensuring that our students start every day with, with a good breakfast. Carter, where are you? Thank you, and thank you to everyone and one of your staff. We appreciate it. <laughs> okay, moving on to uh, committee reports. We have the personnel committee. Um, that would be me. Um, we met on February 27th, at, uh, 2019, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, the minutes say we started at 1.21 a.m., but really it was 1.21 p.m. Um, and all of the members of the committee were present, and we went into closed session and discussed personnel issues. Okay, thank you. And the meeting ended at 4.15. A.m. or p.m.? P.m. Yeah. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Next item on the agenda is Charter School Authorizer Competency Requirement. I will turn this over to Sandy Robinson. You all have a stack of papers related to this. Uh, we won't go through all of it, but I do want to just review the, the cover memo. Um, as you know, the, our Charter School, the Chain Exploration Center, received a grant of $650,000 plus. Um, it's, we are, the school is a sub-grantee for the federal grant that the state of Wisconsin received. And it comes with requirements, um, including requirements for the authorizer and support for the authorizer to do its job well. And the authorizer being? Being the Board of Education. Thank you. And, and actually, not in terms of an authority sense as much, but um, our administrators are considered part of the authorizer team but not the formal authorizer, for purposes of training, anyway. Um, they're considered to be that. So last year, we were required to have at least one authorizer participate in one training session that the Wisconsin Resource Center for Charter Schools, better known as WORKS, held. That was the, the requirement. I went to a number of them. We have one here in-house that a number of board members attended. We fulfilled our competency requirement to be by doing that. This year, um, there are requirements to, the requirements now are um, geared toward demonstrating that we are planning and taking action in improving the work that we do. And some of this, uh, and, and being able to demonstrate that on an online program called HeadRush that will be accessible not only to people who are affiliated with the CDC, the board, teachers, um, administrators, but also every other charter school in the state. So we would, in essence, become a resource that they could look at and tap into when we use some of our documents as templates, and we could also 
search the file and get access to things. So it, it, you can make it what you want to do, but we are required to not only um, develop our competencies, but we are allowed to, we are required to demonstrate that we've done that. And so we need to demonstrate, one person needs to demonstrate one competency for this year. That's the authorizer requirement. And, um, When you say demonstration or demonstrate, it is documentation. Of documentation, how yes. That. How we meant that. So the, the words competency, actually, there are competency assignments not only to the authorizer, but also to the Charter Governance Council, um, the Charter School Leader, the Charter School Classroom, that would be teachers. And then there's one competency assigned to a non-charter school staff, it could be a non-charter school teacher, a principal, administrator, or other district level staff needs to participate in one of the works charter school or leader development programs via the classroom or leader competencies. Interestingly, even last year where the requirement was to participate in one works training, um, that was probably the most difficult for many districts to accomplish, um, to find that. So, um, Page three has a spreadsheet that will show you. <coughs> Are you able to move that up then to page three or whoever has oh, control? That's the right of movement. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I just need to see page three here. Works has created. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, everyone. Works has created a spreadsheet listing all the competencies that each domain needs to accomplish. And I've <coughs> shown, I, I, did, I extracted the spreadsheet that shows um, what the authorizer competencies are. And I think we can make a good case that we've already accomplished for 2019 a certain level of competency within three of the, the topic group areas. One is community engagement and the competency is provides community resources explaining the school options. Well, our, our website has links to each of our schools. Um, so that would be something that we could demonstrate we provided a resource. It doesn't mean we stop there. It just means that it, at this point, we've done that. Um, we, have, we have established and reviewed the charter contract to ensure alignment with the works and DPI benchmarks. And so we could post a copy of our charter contract to satisfy that, and then the plans and sets mission for authorizing with clear goals that align with the community and geography, allowing for autonomy for charter schools. We have our district mission and priorities. We have the community conversation that we had, and we have a policy on, on uh, charter schools. Now, of course, the, the works slash DPI will review these to say yay or nay to them, but I spent a good deal of time talking with the Associate Director of Works on Monday about this. Um, my, I, I had a series of recommendations then at the, on page two of the memo, the four of them. And I do have a recommendation with regard to the, the competency that we might work on together this year. And it is number four. It's an authorizer competency related to mission. And it reads, develops and refines the authorizer's vision and understanding of legal and philosophical roles and responsibilities. And so recommendation number one is that a board committee of three, maybe four people be formed to work on this authorizer competency and then present it to the board as a whole for refinement for modification and adoption. Um, recommendation two has to do with building the capacity to fulfill this competency well, and it involves at least three members of the board and everyone, if they wish and can, attend a training session that's currently being developed by WORKS, which is Effective Authorizer and Governance Board Relationship. This module discusses specific strategies for building strong, transparent relationships between district authorizers and charter school governance boards. 
The module will, pro will provide resources and materials to help both entities collaboratively meet the needs of all students in the district. I think it's important to note that WORKS, while it was developed um, as an organization, as part of the federal funding that Wisconsin DPI received, and they do have a, a mission to help charter schools, whether they got the grants or not, they also are there to help all schools in the state. So the, the description of the workshop goes on to say, with clear performance measures and understanding, district authorizers can be transparent with the review and renewal process for each charter school in the district while still allowing for autonomy. So transparency, autonomy, collaboration, meeting the needs of all students, those are really key points, um, key starting points for any development of a charter school, which is why, I, I, and this would help, um, would help us develop a direction for fulfilling this mission competency that, that's outlined. Um, the third recommendation is that we request that, if possible, WORKS provide the workshop here in Oaxaca so that we could invite the CDC Governance Council and members of our administrative team to join us at that meeting. And um, Nick, at, uh, who's the Associate Director at WORKS, had said that they are willing to come to districts to, if, if and when they can, if it's possible, to present. Um, so it would be nice to take advantage of that. The recommendation number four is that two board members attend training on how to navigate this online tracking and documentation system called HeadRush. And again, works, when I was talking with um, WORKS Associate Director Nick Krakowski yesterday, he, generous, he spent an hour with me on the phone, which was so generous. And he then went on to, again, generously offer a training session this Thursday between 9 and 10. It's a Zoom online tele it's an online conference, so you can log in via your computer anywhere. Um, I am, I, I, I plan to be there uh, as one of the <coughs> board members. Is there anyone else? Megan is going to participate from the Governance Council. Rhonda's already had training. Would you be interested? I would. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could have more than, than two if someone else is also interested, but if you would be. Mm -hmm. I'm then I'll send the Zoom link to both. Okay. Can you access those from your home uh, computer? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's kind of like a conference call. It is. And and if you have a camera, your smiling face will be on there oh. too. And it's really nice. It's really nice. You can, you can turn those off. <laughs> I don't think I have that. No. I, I can tell you from having them, it's really nice for the presenters if they can see you. So or maybe I don't know if I have that. <laughs> You can find out quickly. <laughs> or you could. <laughs> no, I'd be happy to. Okay, so Betty. Do you realize he's zooming the camera and yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so Sandy, okay. I'm, I'm getting back to that, uh, yeah. the uh, training on, on Thursday, about how many participants, I mean schools, would be actively involved in that conference, do you think? On Thursday? Yeah. It's just us. Oh, it's just, just directly, just in, oh, it's specifically for what backup? Yeah, well, yeah, it was just okay. going to be me, and I said, oh gosh. Let me oh, see I if get. I can wrangle other people. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Because I thought maybe it was again uh, with no. a, like a consortium. No, okay. there are, there are plenty of, of workshops, and if you go, to the, I urge you to go to the Works website and go under resources, and then look at training, because they have um, not only real time workshops scheduled, but they have something called Buzz, which are accessible anytime. You know, you want to do some training at midnight you can. Uh, the nice thing, the thing that I'd like to promote with these recommendations is that we all have a, an understanding of what we're talking about here and we have a conversation about what we're learning in the workshop. And I think that's just really, really key. Okay. Okay. And so you'll find there are attachments in addition to the, the spreadsheet I've included the we are considered because the CDC is the in the first year of the grant cycle of the five-year grant cycle another cycle started this year um, considered cohort one and
and these are the year two works requirements. There's more detail then about what is involved in that. And then the third and probably it's the longest document is Wisconsin Charter School Authorizing Best Practices. Um, it was included as a, a resource as an FYI document. So at this point, we are looking for a motion to adopt any of these recommendations. Specifically, this is a recommendation being brought forward. Uh, they are competencies that we must fulfill. Uh, but we, other than item number four, which is for this Thursday at 9 a.m., uh, they are items that can be brought together and, and developed further after this meeting. Yes, the deadline for completing the documentation on um, Headbrush is August 30th, 2019. It's nice, of course, some, Nick said some districts are filling it out as they go. Some are probably going to wait till the very end. I like the notion of filling it out sooner in case there's some shortcoming or something that they want to see. Um, and, and this isn't to say you couldn't do additional competencies. Certainly the one related to monitoring, which is number seven on the, the spreadsheet, um, annual monitoring creates refines annual monitoring of school success, including a monitoring tool and rubric um, that could be as simple as the criteria is met. Not quite yet. We need some work. So, Sandy, does this <coughs> uh, document, is this uh, instigated because of our uh, receiving the grant proposal, or is this for whether we receive the grant, a grant or not? It is because we, it is part of the grant requirements. Okay, yes. and does it come primarily from the feds, or is this, is this a document that's used by both Wisconsin? Well, I think this is Wisconsin's way of ensuring that they are going to be able to say they've accomplished what the federal grant is asking them to do. Okay, and so, so so when we turn it in, it goes to, say, somebody down in Madison, but then it also moves up the ladder? I'm okay. not sure what they'll do with the information um, or how they would share it. it the, the head rush information is accessible to the works people and, and thus the UPI. Uh, okay. So this is a way for them to make sure that we each grant, each authorizing school district or authorizer is fulfilling its responsibilities to make sure that um, we're doing a good job growing, getting better at our, that's, that's really what Nick kept on saying is this is a growth model. They want to help us get better at doing what we do. And they hope we'll be able to comply with the learning not only to our work with the charter school, but with the district as a whole. Right. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions at this time? Okay, if you'll send those links out to Mark and Betty and include me as well, I will, I believe, be able to sit in on it and tell our, and still make my meeting in Vanderlock. So I appreciate that. Do we need to post that? That was going to be a question I asked. Yeah. Can you interact at all? Yes, other? Yes. Okay, well, if I drop out of that and it's just the three of you, we should be all right then. Oh, it's four. Oh, no. Pat, you wanted it too? Well, I, I, I didn't commit, but I, I was thinking of if I had the opportunity, I'd jump in, but maybe. It's easy enough to post. I mean, I don't mind posting. I just sure. Yeah, I think you ought to post it because I might like to. Yeah, I, I, need to I, I, I just don't know if my calendar's on, on Thursday right at the moment. I need but. to talk with Nick about how we would make it accessible. Oh, yeah. I might have to post the Zoom link. Let's, uh, pending that information, let's hold on posting and make sure that we do not have too many people in attendance on this. At this point, as long as there are at least two yeah. and we can get future training for others, right. either from those that do participate uh, or sure. through Nick or however we may want to do it. And it might be possible for him to record the session. Almost like a podcast yeah. or something. Yeah. So at this point, do we want to just have it be me and Betty? And yeah, I'll say no then. That'll Mark. make it easy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. Anything else? Not for me. All right, we'll move on to the administrator section. Uh, 
on February 14th, uh, we received a uh, hand delivery notice from uh, Chartwells, from their Compass Group uh, Division, Senior Corporate Counsel David Strauss, indicating their intent to exercise a notice of value <coughs> renewal with the district. Their last day of service per the agreement will be on June 30th, 2019. So we are beginning to uh, plan for a transition away from Chartwells and back to a district run program. And there is no action being done that. No action being done. Next item on the agenda, calendar adjustment for 2018-2019. Yes. Weather? Yes, so we've had um, quite the winter, as you know. Uh, we discussed earlier the impact to uh, the, the roof over the gymnasium, um, and it also gave cause to miss uh, six full days of school and have two late starts. And knock on wood, we're still early in March. So um, hopeful that we won't have to come back to the table and make another round of adjustments, but uh, in the event we do, We'd like to um, we'd like to know where we're at. So, the administration has considered a, a number of uh, makeup options. Uh, everything that you see on the list, uh, numbers one through six, has had significant discussion with our, our principal group and our, our central office administration. And the uh, administration um, certainly believes that an argument could be made to do any one or combination of those uh, in order to get back to the required number of instructional minutes and hours. Um, however, we believe that options one through three will allow us to uh, recoup the instructional time that we need, uh, bring us back into compliance with a small cushion of time. Yes, sir. I have one, one question. So um, you, your, your recommendation is from options one through three, is it either one of those or is all it all three? three? Uh, so all three. all three. So when I was looking at this, um, the 15.6 hours, if you add up one, two, and three, that's 17.75. Mm -hmm. So that's over the 15. Right. Points. Just enough for a two hour late start if we need one. Oh, I, in case something happens in the right. So that's with the, right. the pad. That's the small cushion. I really need to. What about for 4K? Because they were under two. Yeah, 4K has a little more flexibility because they don't have session on Friday. Mm -hmm. So they can they can easily add a session in there, and it was really the morning 4K that was short uh, because of the two hour late starts on those two days. So will that be automatic, that we'll just add a session for them? Uh, yeah, Rhonda and um, uh, Director Marcon will work on that mm -hmm. solution. Yeah. Um, and then I noticed in this, it said if we go that route, um, that the last day for teachers then would be Monday, June 10th. And the teachers would be responsible for working two days prior to August 5th, is that correct? Correct. Why August 5th? Well, that's the beginning of uh, the Institute. Okay. And so as, as we enter into the Institute, it's shortly thereafter that we've got the kickoff. And so rather than trying to track those days when you've got, you know, new contract days and old contract days, we just uh, thought that August 5th would provide ample time for that to happen. I think one through three, it only takes them to the Friday, Friday, not the Monday. But it says the last day for teachers would be Monday. Oh, teachers, so yeah, yeah. They're yeah. coming okay, back for one day. Correct. <coughs> yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay, and then they'd make up two days. Yeah, yeah. The same. yeah. Right. We'll uh, <coughs> Any of the one through six where we are extending the day, what is the impact, if any, to transportation and the coordination thereof between buildings? Yeah, it, it should be none or minimal. Um, because we didn't transport students for those six days, uh, our contract actually should come in a little bit under 
budget. So <coughs> adding that day um, will, will still be a net of five under. About from a coordination standpoint between the hours for the different buildings or the yeah. start stop times. Yep. We, we've we've uh, had conversations with uh, Director Lee Nowicki and he indicates that options one through three are very achievable. Yeah. Yeah. Option three, is that just pertain to the high school? school or all students? It would be for all students. Oh, yeah. So we'll be yes. over hours for all the other grades if yeah. there is another snow day. Oh yes, we, we we only we're only tight on hours at the high school right. because of the way that we calculate minutes. Mm -hmm. The elementary and middle school have plenty of time. But you're still bringing them back for an extra day. Yes. <coughs> Why? Why would we bring the other grades back? Why not just just the high school? Well, I guess uh, you know, I hadn't given much thought to that. Uh, it seems like uh, if you've got families with multiple age students, um, you know, if the older students are <coughs> at school and the younger ones are at home, you know, is, is that going to be an issue for any families? I don't know. Um, but rather than saying we're going to have just this group of students report to school, what is the what is the unintended message there? I guess that we just want to achieve the minimum number of instructional minutes and call that good, or is one more day in a classroom, you know, you know, certainly not going to hurt. Is this the lady then? I'm figuring it's not that they're going to be attending more than they would have. Correct. So it's not that they're exceeding. Correct. They would have. They would have been 60 hours over. Let's just say, for argument's sake, at the elementary, but with the the, the reduction of you know six days, five days on the net, you know, there's there's still 25 or 30 hours over. So they're still going to school less than what they would have. With if the calendar had not been interrupted. It just seems to me like um, asking the teachers to have to work uh, in those schools a day beyond what they should need to seems um, to be leaning a little bit hard on them. And uh, it's going to cost the district more. Well, teachers are contracted. Teachers are contracted well, for a specific service. number of days. Food service. And Actually, I believe, and I certainly asked Dar to speak to this, but I, I think we've got, you know, the food is usually planned out in a, in a budgetary uh, aspect. So, you know, if we if we didn't have school, uh, you know, what would be the impact there, Dar? Is there an additional expense if we bring students back for Friday? It's it's just worth the piece. We get the we have the cost of the food and the cost of the, the wages, but we also get the reimbursement from those meals. So we're prepared for and and so all of these people yeah, would then get paid for days that they weren't able to work during the week. Yeah, you're also running into the contract show days. It's June tenth for teachers. Not ideal, right? Uh, they're making up on June seventh. Would be probably you choose speak, you speak speak water? Water? Um, you're the con the contractual aspect for the teachers uh, they're now being extended to June 10th correct uh, uh, without the seventh that'd be next there is another day and there isn't there that's missing what? contractually so if you would say I would uh, say we don't I think yeah. what I'm saying is if we don't have the students there on the seventh mm -hmm. the right. teachers would still have to be there the seventh Ninth and tenth or seventh, and yes. without looking at it. Correct. Okay. Whether well, the students are there on that Friday or not. Correct. Because what? the teachers have been paid for those six days. Is there? Is there? <clears throat> this is kind of changing the subject a little bit. Is there any interference with summer school by coming back on the tenth? No. Summer school starts the following. So it would start on the seventeenth. Yeah. How does it affect the right way? Not at all. It doesn't. 
so it doesn't they, they bill us for every day that they provide transportation okay so our drivers will get paid for a day i mean they're out six days right but they'll get paid for one of those five or six days correct but if they drive that day correct. as will all our non-contract workers oh, or no. non-teachers will get paid a day out of the six that they didn't get to work the um, the hourly wages yeah yeah i believe those folks have already been paid for for the snow days oh okay i didn't think they got paid on days that didn't work yeah, yeah. we're going to wait to adjust to see if there's more snow days so correct they don't get paid yes. okay so they're not paid yet yeah they're not paid yet no they're paid but they're we're going to adjust paid. their salary accordingly if there was more snow days okay. it's easier for us to pay as is and then work backwards oh okay I, I know in the past, um, the, I'm talking about the teachers' work days now. This board has addressed that several different ways. One was that they would have them make it up like this proposal recommends. Sometimes in the past, they moved it to that next contract year in the fall. Mm -hmm. But then there were other times where they dropped it off and they did not make the teachers make up those work days. So there is, I, that stood, that is an option. And I know what, what you guys are trying to do with these learning targets. I know you're trying to get everybody on board to get these learning targets all implemented uh, uh, with the new grading, with the new grading system. But is that, that whole grading system, it's not gonna be implemented next year, it's the following year that, that is going to be implemented. Well, it depends on where we're at. I mean, if we're ready to implement it in two years, sure, but if we're not ready to implement it in two years, because we understand that this has caused disruption to it. And so, yeah, we have a goal, but that doesn't mean that goal can't be adjusted based off where we're at. I mean, we had conversations with teachers last week and the week prior to check in with them to see where they're at. And, uh, you know, if that timeline has to be adjusted, that timeline has to be adjusted. And I know that the, the, the in-service day that the students came, um, and, and, and did they work on that task at was that the task that they were going to work on during that in service? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. That so was so that was one day of, of work that, that they didn't get to work on, on those tasks. Correct. So that and I can understand how that that one for sure would have to be made up because they had you had an agenda to accomplish um, certain things. But um and so that that is one of the days that would have been the Monday, if I'm just trying to think in my head for accounting purposes, that day that we missed that in-service, we had the students, that would be that Monday or one of the days in the summer, then we're still asking for, for two more on top of that. And what would their, uh, on that Monday when they come back, what would the teacher's task be that day? Would it be closing up and, and getting their grades in, or would it be working on that, the, the task for the, the grading system? Traditionally, I mean, the last day of school has been closing up shop and, and taking care of those things as need be. Uh, and I guess that's what we look forward to the same this year. That would so that's the Monday the tenth that's that you're talking about, right? Breakfast, the celebrations, and then they close up by the end of the day, right? Okay. And Mark, going back to your early comment, yeah. we're, we're really doing a, a combination of all three. So some of the days are are just being forgiven or they're they're almost in lieu of the additional time that teachers are spending on Wednesdays okay, beyond the normal contract time and then um, one of the days is added on and that's June 10th and then two of the days are flexible carryover throughout the summer so we're, we're really doing a, a combination of all three of the practices from the past So, you know, and I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm treading on the, the Wednesdays here. And I see you're adding 24 minutes, so uh, that would be until 2.24. So, so I state this properly. What happens if you look at the option of just going till 3.15 on those Wednesdays? And then schools. use that last 45 minutes to still working how many um, uh, hours would that recoup if we went just to the end of the school day on Wednesday at 3.15? Because 
because that's another 45 plus six, that's another 51 minutes a day we would be picking up for April in and it sounds like that would certainly put us well within the margin. That would well, but then the drawback yeah. is then the teachers wouldn't be on the task to work on the thing. But if they had the two days in the summer, it could possibly be made up that way. So you're trying to move that back so that it all ends on Friday, I think is what you're asking. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of what I'm I'm at if if, if we go till three fifteen at the high school and then then that we wouldn't they wouldn't have to come back that Monday but they would still have their two days in the summer. I know. I'm just I, I don't have to you're talking, this you say 315, you're talking about the students. Yeah. Okay. And it just, yeah, make it so that way. So like your discussion was centering on teachers, so I want to make sure I was understanding you correctly. We get to 12 and a half hours um, by going to the, the 315. If we started that, there's 10 Wednesdays after we come back from spring break. It, so if we were to do that, but then we also just start school the, what is it, eight minutes earlier, would that bring us to about the 15 hours we need? So if 24 hours is equal to, if 24 minutes results in four hours, then the question is how many minutes, uh, you know, how many hours to 60 minutes? You know, is, that, is that the equation basically? Well, so that's 10 hours. You'd have to work it out on a spreadsheet or something. I mean, you could. But so, so 24 is equal 75 minutes. minutes per day difference is what you're talking about between a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday versus a Wednesday. So if you multiply that 75 minutes times that 10, so there's 10 left, there's 750 minutes, would be what you'd be adding back into the calendar. Divided by 60, puts you at 12 and a half hours. So by just getting rid of earlier these Wednesdays, starting after spring break, you're gonna add 12 and a half hours back into the day. Student hours, just student hours, correct. Just yeah. student hours. So you're still being 3.1 hours. Then you could start the high school day eight minutes earlier as well. And with those two measures, you could handle it without having to mess with the other grade. If you add an additional, so it'd be 16 minutes. What do you think? No, so we'll keep the number one, and yeah. then for number two, instead of 24 minutes longer on Wednesdays, have them stay to the end of the day mm -hmm. on Wednesdays, like they used to. And those two items alone, just in the high school to take care of the problem. Is that what you're, what you're well, kind of getting at? It's kind of going that way, but. Abby, um, what do you think? But I think for, for all you Wait. kids uh, following along at home right now, <laughs> <laughs> this is the importance of math problems in your math class. That's what you need Today to we're doing things. word problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious as to what Abby thinks. Yeah. Uh, I like the idea, like, I know that the, um, like early release Wednesdays are essential for like the teachers like working and like getting like all their work done that they need to like grading and stuff like that. But um, I think if we were to get rid of those and then do the four minutes um, after school, as I think that's like in part six, the second part of that, um, that would be like three and a half hours we would be adding on, as well as what were the 12 and a half that we have from getting rid of Wednesdays. And so that would put us at um, just over 15 or 15 itself, and that would be the all the hours we need. And that way, we wouldn't need to start early, which could mess with um, some kids' like schedules, and um, myself included. I'm not the I'm not my best self in the morning. And although um, eight minutes really doesn't seem like that much, it is kind of a lot when you're a student. You're running around trying to get dressed and find your homework and whatever else you didn't do the night before. Um, but you said you do chores. Yeah, and I also live on a farm, and I have chores to do in the morning. Um, so that would just be like one more thing on top of all of that if we were to start earlier. Um, that um, farm kids have to worry about or like if I know a lot of kids like help get their siblings ready and that's another thing they'd have to worry about <coughs> and like sometimes the buses don't align or like parents leaving like I don't know. You guys probably figured a lot of stuff in but my opinion. <laughs> yeah so we, we just for the sake of everyone uh, and the sake of the discussion we have been discussing these options for weeks and it is, uh, it is a daunting task at best to try to find the options that will continue to move all of the initiatives forward 
and keep us compliant with the hours and minutes requirements. So what, what we have done is we've put together the, the recommendation that we believe is going to be the least intrusive and also continue to move the district forward. If the board has objectives and they want the administration to bring back another option, then I would say let us know what the objectives are and we'll work backward from there. But for example, if, if Mark, you, you want everything to be done on Friday or Thursday, uh, let us know. And if that's the will of the board, we can come back next month with a plan. Yeah, <coughs> I, I, I think that's always been uh, as a teaching part of the teaching staff to, to end by the end of the week for for the teachers is always uh, a major concern simply because of summer and it isn't just our summer school but oftentimes teachers are involved in other things that start the Monday after and this is already sort of late the seventh we many times have been done by the first or second of June. Uh, and again, um, just for our viewing audience, you know, in 40 years, this is the first time we've had to deal with six days. You can see how easy it is if we have one or two. So far. So far. I mean, that, that's why we're having this big discussion. Normally, it's pretty much a no-brainer. We add a day here and there, and you're done. But this is a little bit, a little bit trickier. So um, my suggestion, along with Mark sort of has brought it up, but I, I think if we can end on the, on the Friday for our entire district, uh, always sits better with people in, in parents as well. That's one of the objectives. If it's possible, though, for me the priority would be to try to accommodate what Abby is saying about student right. and family schedules. Yeah. But that would be, for me, a, a very high priority, as I'm sure for yeah. But I, I, I'm I not quite sure how those two things would be possible together. We can certainly take a look at it. Welcome. Well, I mean, bottom line is we're making the best of the worst case decisions. I mean, no one wants to lose professional development. No one wants to go into the second week of June. No one wants to shorten the spring break or go on a good Friday or do all these things we've talked about. Like, we, we get it. We're making, again, trying to make the best of the situation. And as he said, first time in 40 years we've lost six and a half days, and it's March 12th, so we still have a long ways to go. Yeah. I, Mark, I have a question for you. So on these, on these days that would be in the summer, that would kind of like flexible or whatever yeah. it is. Um, is this something that the staff can work from home or is this something that they physically have to come and meet with their department? We want them working as a team. You want them working as a team. So they have to coordinate and all be here. But it could be flexible to the point where different teams might meet at different times or would you think mm -hmm. what, yeah, we'd be a little flexible on that, so. I think that'd be the best thing for the staff. And you know, if they come in four hours here or four hours there. I mean, again, hearing from staff what they enjoy about those early Wednesdays, it's a, it's a chunk of time usually to work. And, you know, you're not just talking about a 45 minute or a half an hour chunk of time, talking several hours. That's what gets the best results. Okay, it seems to me we don't have a clear consensus on this at this point in time. I think the recommendation at this point from consensus is to uh, take a look at it again and maybe sharpen the pencil and see what else you can come up with. And uh, we'll look at it in a month. I, I mean, we're not going to be able to, to know what the end result is for at least another month, month we, anyway. If we need to spend, call a special meeting, we can. Uh, yes. Before we delay a decision on this, the less time we have in order to address the shortfall in hours or minutes. Um, so from that perspective, we will ask the so my only concern about waiting and coming back is, is when's the next board meeting? That's what well, I was just saying. Saying. We we saying. We can have a special, have a special one at any to time. address it. It okay. could be next week. It could be whenever. But uh, I think one of the sensitivities that I would like to make sure uh, that we are looking at is the students. And right. quite honestly, adding one minute to a class to me, I'm not sure what that does accomplish other than simply making up time as required as opposed to the educational opportunity. So I think we need to be sensitive. I realize you're thinking about that. Uh, that would just be one of my requests as you uh, revisit this and we can schedule a meeting for if next week is reasonable uh, to come up with a final determination. 
in, in fact, that does bring up a question. Are these numbers based on if one of this was approved, it starts tomorrow? No, they're, they're, they're going to be implemented after spring break. Okay, and that you said that. Right, so yeah. we have to, we'll have yeah. to make some new calculations, and what we understand is you want the staff to be done on Friday. Is that accurate? Well, I think that's certainly one option that would we would like to see, and I think um, Abby's idea, <coughs> I think, is very, very valid as well. Maybe the set of morning goes a little later during the day might work. Things like that. I, yeah, I'd say in my mind that's number one. So, the only thing about going a little bit later is I believe we may run into busing issues faster than in the morning, just because of you know they're transporting kids between the multitude of buildings and what times the students get here, which is why we're looking at zero minimal cost impact and trying to balance those things out. <coughs> so the last bus typically drops kids off here at seven. The other thing, if you extend it on the day with spring sports and athletics and activities, you, you tend to have more and more students missing class, especially in the spring if you go longer. Right. But if you start earlier in the morning, that means all the students in the district have to start earlier. No, because the last bus, the, the, the late bus that drops kids off here, uh, 740. So if we start at 747, we'll still, we'll still have seven minutes to get oh, to class. Oh, so they kill time once Correct. the bus drops them off. I Correct. Guess. Okay. Well, the schedule isn't as flex, isn't as loose in the afternoon, is my understanding, but we'll revisit that. Okay. There's quite a few, my sister goes to school, she's at the middle school, and from what she tells me, there's quite a few times when, at least in the winter, with like the roads kind of being bad conditions, um, where she's riding and just as the bell is ringing, she has like just a couple minutes to get to class. Yeah, we're not talking about just in the middle school schedule, we're, we're talking just here. But if we had changed the busing, if there's high school students who ride the buses. Right. But, what I'm saying is we wouldn't need to adjust the bus route or the schedules of anything because the last bus that drops kids off here does so by 7.40 in the morning. Okay, okay. So, so we're not, we're not lunch, changing. You just have lunch time to wake up and get to your lunch. Yeah. Right. right. Does that make sense? Yeah. They're not pick up your time. They're establishing <laughs> social connections. They're establishing <laughs> social <laughs> connections <laughs> on their phones. Right. 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 Okay. Got it. Okay. All right, we will call uh, a meeting. Uh, we appreciate your, your understanding of what the board is hoping to accomplish. We appreciate all the time and work that's gone into this recommendation at this point. Okay, next item on the agenda, professional educator staffing for 2019-20. Dr. Neal? Yes, so I'm gonna uh, ask uh, Mr. Clayton to walk us through this, uh, this document um, ultimately, we're looking for some direction from the board as to how you, you want us to approach staffing in general for the upcoming year. And you know, we really see that there are three basic options to, uh, to that approach. Uh, there's a flat approach where you say, okay, we've got 164 FTE this year, we've got a balanced budget, bring us 164 FTE in the plan for next year. And you do whatever magic you do to make that work. Or if we're uh, looking to add <coughs> multiple FTE and the board is comfortable with tasking the administration to just add those FTE and figure the budget out, that's another approach. Or the final approach is if there are opportunities for attrition, then take advantage of those as appropriate. So that's the direction that we're looking for, uh, the overarching direction, but I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Clayton to uh, walk us through this document here. Yeah, so this was kind of a, a detailed layout of the transition from the chain to the CEC in terms of impact on staffing. That's where this is really rooted in as far as what we can predict and what we can analyze. And so I wanted to really start off by reminding you back in September of 2017, the board agreed um, to open up this charter school. At that point in time, there was, a, there was a presentation that was linked that was shared with you. And in there, they did talk about the additional need for staffing that this would cause onto the district. And so, and then I just want to remind you that there's multi multitude of times in which information was shared with the board um, along where we're at. 
So if you scroll down in the page, and, and it gets into the philosophy of the, uh, of the charter school as well to make sure we're all on the same page and understanding why this is, this is um, occurring. And then the next couple of charts really talk about where those shifts are at. And so that's why I use the combination of letters and numbers to represent cohorts of students, and the colors on there actually represent teachers. And so if you can follow, uh, this is the next year, this is this year's school year, and next year's school year in terms of uh, the top row there is 18, 19, the number of sections at the chain of the CEC. So you can see on this chart that they have two sections of kindergarten currently, they have two sections of first grade currently, they have two sections of second grade currently, they have one section of third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade currently out there. Next year, um, what we'd like to be able to do is there will be, again, two sections of kindergarten, two sections of first grade, we're going to go down to one section of second grade, a section of third grade, a section of fourth grade, a section of fifth grade, and we're going to add a section of sixth grade. That's that expansion of the CEC. And so when you follow those, that, that pattern, so in 18, 19, that KA group, one of the two kindergarten groups, you can see both of the kindergarten groups just slid over to first grade at the chain CEC. That's the KA and KB. Um, as far as staff goes, again, the, these colors aren't really meant to indicate actual people, just for ease of conversation just to say that those four teachers are staying out there in terms of those colors. However, at the second grade, you see when you're going from two sections down to one section, you gotta do something different with that second teacher. So that's where that red jumps all the way to 5B in 1920. Again, let me be really clear, I'm not saying we're moving a second grade teacher to teach fifth grade, but just for easeability of, of tracking the staffing that goes along with it, that's, that's how the CDC maintain its staffing. And then uh, the 1A and the 2A are groups of new students that would go to the WLC. However, <coughs> when we look at enrollments and we do some projections, we're only gonna need one new teacher because we're gonna absorb that 1A group into that current second grade uh, mix of students and we'll still be underneath our required AGR of 18 to one ratio. However, in third grade, we would need a new teacher out of the WLC to accompany that cohort of students. And that's the transition that would, would happen next year. Can I? Yeah. I'm not quite sure what you're saying. 1920 <coughs> in the second grade area, there's an X there, and I understand that one of the first grades that had been at Chain is now going to move over to the second grade at WLC. Is that correct? That's that 1A cohort from 1A first grade to okay. 1A second grade. And you then are correct. The 1B stays out of the CEC. Yep. Because that will become. CEC second grade because we're adding a second We're expanding the CDC in 1920 okay. to include right. second through sixth grade. Okay. And then 2A is that where you see an X in the second grade for the chain, 2A moves over to the WLC third grade. Correct. Okay. Got it. Yep. So what is the total number of teachers we have at the building right now at the chain? Either CEC or nine. nine. What is it? Nine. So, and you're at, so next year, if we're sitting here a year from now, how many would we like to see at the chain in a perfect world? Still be nine. Mm -hmm. Would still be nine. Okay. Different positions, I understand. And, but nine this year, nine next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mark, you have that book on your face? Yeah, yeah. I do. <laughs> and, and there's a second chart. I'm trying to make sense of this. What you mean is going to help you? Well, Trust me, this is taking us hours and wait your way to, to try to simplify it as much as possible. So, if, if, so can I project something? If, if, if yeah, say, it, it'll help if you project a little bit. Let me just try something here. How come we're adding staff if the number of students are staying the same? Right? I mean, we're not increasing the number of students that are being serviced um, by the chain of the CEC. So how come we're adding staff? Well, what we're doing, instead of that um, fifth grade group graduating and going on to um, the middle school, they're staying. Yeah, and, right. you know, we do 18 to 1 staffing, pretty standard in, in, in L, well, we do K3, 
Fourth grade, probably average class size, is a little, you know, low 20s. Fifth, fifth grade and beyond, it, it's, it's different. It's not an 18 to one scenario. So just because 18 kids aren't going to the middle school doesn't mean that you could eliminate a teacher from the middle school. Because again, how our, our, our grades, our schedules are set up, that doesn't equate to a full-time teacher. So your recommendation at the bottom of this says only one new to the district teacher would be needed uh, to be placed for next year. Yeah, to be placed at the second grade. Oh, um, the memo is incorrect. It should be to oh. place at the third grade because um, the numbers at the second, you know, this year's so, first grade class can absorb 18 more kids without adding a teacher. It just bumps up the average classes. But we're still below the 18 to one ratio. So that's the two A on your chart there at the bottom. Correct. Again, 1A and 2A are just to, just to physically represent cohorts of kids or a class of students. Okay, so my question originally was, how many teachers do we have at the W, uh, the, um, the chain, chain was nine, and next year we'll have nine. And again, I just want to be clear, technical, when you say chain, I'm assuming chain and CEC. Correct. Correct. In the bill. Right. Okay, so, and maybe you don't know the number right now, but what, what do you anticipate or our suggestion in terms of the WLC for next year? I believe we go from 34 to 35. So you're talking about this one? This is core academics. Sorry. I understand. So you're talking about one full-time position added at the elementary? Correct. The highlighted portion. And that's, yeah. The highlighted portion? Only so one new one. teacher to the district will be needed, which we place, oh, it should I say, third grade, not second grade. For Talk uh, a fair amount about the chain specifically on the uh, CEC. What uh, share with us where you see based on, and I know you don't know what the birth rates were four years ago or whatever the case may be, but where are we on total student population? Um, I think when we looked at things, I think one of the, 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 the wild cards, if you would, would be that 4K enrollment that's hard to project. Um, but pretty flat, or I think we're up two or three kids based off that. Two or three kids? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't did we add a 4K section at the beginning of this year? So I think our 4K is, is up, uh, yeah, up a section. So if we assume 4K remains constant for next year, right. I realize you don't have that crystal ball, and we move forward the students A grade, what what are we looking at as to student population? Is it like a total number? Or I'm not following you 100%. Are we, are we, we've been getting smaller over the years. Are we continuing to get smaller? Is our current uh, kindergarten smaller than our graduating class? Based on my calculations, it's about three kids and more. Okay. Next year compared to this year. So assuming 4K remains constant, correct. everything else remains right. quite constant if you're looking at three or four. Statistically speaking, correct. Thank you. So now you're gonna take us to the next level, I suspect, and move to the... Well, yeah, because what I wanna make sure is, is that we're all on the same page with what um, staffing the changes. I think when things were initially presented back in 2017 and so forth, we all looked at it through just the lens of the CEC without realizing it's going to have a different impact on the entire district. And, and um, you, you did have some documentation at that point in time that I understand that there was conversation that there was going to be additional staffing requests. I, I just don't think it's fair to continually come back and, and, and ask for those things when that's what we agreed to. But I also understand that maybe you haven't seen it laid out like this. So I wanted to present to you that entire plan so that you know not only for next year, but the year after, and the year after that, when that and the CEC is full K-8, what that's gonna look like from a district and from a staffing standpoint. Now, going back to your point, realize that for you know, the 2021-21-22 the school year, obviously the further out you go through projections on enrollment, uh, you're probably gonna have a greater variance for, for differences. So I'm using the data, the information that we currently have in you know, IC to roll those things forward in saying that the 4K class size is going to remain relatively constant. I don't know what the birth rates were, you know, four years ago, and I don't know if they're going to be in two years from today, I, you know what I'm saying? Right. So these are all based off those projections, and that's why it says predicted in this document as well. 
I will say though, uh, getting back to your original comment, I think when we uh, went forward with the CDC, with the charter school, um, that there was quite a lengthy discussion about there will be some impact. And I think that when we committed, we committed to that. Awesome. And I, to me, personally, as I sit here, I'm committed to the staffing that's necessary to keep that program and all of our programs healthy. Good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So what, what this does is, it, again, carries us out two, two to three years. And um, so next year, it would be grades uh, two through six at the CEC. And so the year after that, what we'd like to do is expedite that transitional process and bring over kinder and first from the chain into the CEC so that in three years we'd only be adding an eighth grade. So the original plan was one at each end of the spectrum. What we'd like to do in two years from now is add two on that lower end so that, that third year we're only adding one on the higher end. And so when you do this same sort of math here and you follow the colors and the cohorts of students, again, the colors are a hypothetical representation of the teachers. So we're not suggesting that According to this, you'd have a kindergarten teacher in 1920 become a seventh grade teacher in 2025. Okay, right. it's just for the math stamp, right? right. Okay, um, but with this, we would have two additional sections coming over, three additional sections, excuse me, coming over to the WLC. One teacher from uh, the chain would accompany one of those three sections. And again, we're just being hypothetical here. We're not saying he's that first grade teacher, but just to make the math there go. And at that point in time, we would have to add two additional teachers for that 4K A group and for the KA group there. So it, it'd be an additional increase of two teachers because when we ran the numbers that we currently have, we can't absorb those teachers into our current numbers at the WLC and not add staff. It doesn't with the work uh, retirement of, I mean, with the addition of one, if we were to follow this recommendation for the 2019-20 school year, with the known retirements that we have, what would you project the budgetary impact? And I realize we don't know exactly what qualifications that one person would have, what uh, uh, credentials, and therefore it would impact their salary. But having said that, if we have X number of retirements and we're bringing one person in, presumably at a lower pay than someone that's retiring, uh, can you give us any ballpark on what that might look like? Me? Yes. I would say um, for the replacement of a teacher at uh, perhaps in the middle end, I'd probably go right straight in the middle. You'd probably be with a full salary and family, uh, health insurance uh, potentially would be uh, a net savings of perhaps $18,000. Okay, but for adding one, okay, so that would be versus a retiring tenure, more highly paid individual. So, and, and you, Carl, would you say that that's true on an average? So, if you are saving twenty thousand dollars, I'm rounding up now. He said eighteen, <coughs> twenty thousand on the, the changeover. Would that be true if we had five teachers teaching? We would save a hundred thousand dollars. That's you know, it's really an absolute because it depends on the position um, because uh, it's a high, it's a highly competitive market. So a lot of times you want to hire at the top end. So I, I understand. You know, that, I hesitate to say that, but I would say that if you're uh, if you're uh, it's the highest uh, the highest paid teacher salary benefits is eighty thousand dollars, and your replacement is in mid range, you can take that replacement cost not to be eighty, uh, subtract uh, eighteen thousand off that, and that right. was your replacement. That would be. Conservative net savings, and if it came in lower, so we have. When you're talking about bringing um, the CEC perhaps expanding two grades on the lower end and one grade the next end, is that based on a conversation you have with the CEC and the Correct. plans? That's okay. Correct. That's right. And, and they would expand um, to seventh grade in 2021, and then for the 21 22 school year, those seventh graders would become eighth graders. Yes. So that would be the final expansion. Got it year, so to speak. And then they would be a full K-8 charter school at the CEC, and you'd have 4K remaining at the chain. Got it. Thank you. Um, I do have... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I'm going <laughs> <I'm gonna, laughs> to jump You probably asked my same question. No, I, I just want to jump to make sure I understand. When you were recommending number three and uh, working with attrition, do you want to 
Could you elaborate on that? I wasn't quite sure whether you were saying. Yeah, may I just for a moment? Um, so we're, we're now at the cap, revenue in the cap. And um, so there's, there's, we don't have that cushion of room that we can go to and say we'll just levy a little bit more to add these positions. Right. So the school budgets are, are very dynamic and uh, there are always a lot of unknowns. For example, we don't know what the budget will be, the next biannual budget. We could be looking at uh, an increase of 200, 204 in year one, year two. That's per student. So you carry that out over 2,100 students and you're looking at approximately $400,000 in, in additional monies or resources in year one, year two. If the special education categorical reimbursement increases from 26% to, I think they're projecting uh, 40%, that would be a uh, uh, savings in the fund 10 to 27 transfer of $330,000, okay? There's also conversation going on at the, at the <coughs> state level around incorporating a, a sustainable aspect uh, revenue stream that would align to CPIU. So if any one or more than one of those comes to fruition, then we've got resources in play to be able to continue with the high quality music program, to continue with uh, our, our arts the way they are, or Phi Ed staffed at the level that it currently is. But those are unknowns. And so the, the, the approach recommended in option three was really um, applying that, that lens of um, common sense uh, to staffing. And what I mean by that is if, if you've got an opportunity to uh, make a reduction by attrition, let's say in an area that uh, we're, we're going, we're serving beyond what is mandatory. So for example, we're providing music and FIED at the 4K level. That's not required. We, we've just been doing that here, okay? And we've got an opportunity for a, re a reduction through attrition. Does it make more sense to make that reduction through attrition? Or do you want to continue with the programming the way that it is, knowing that sometime in the near future then you may be having to issue a layoff notice for somebody who you bring to the district under a scenario that has now changed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we're not looking to uh, cut music. We're not looking to cut the arts. We're just looking to continually be uh, mindful of what our resources are in comparison to our expenses and continue to provide the high quality instruction that we're known for. And so may I follow up? Absolutely. To just make sure that I understand. So what you're not saying, because the CDC was a, a part we're talking about impact to the district that we the board need to help respond to. You're not saying CEC um, rely on attrition to staff no, the CEC no, at all. No. Okay. Well, no. What, what no. The option three is really trying to get to is provide the board choice versus saying this is where we're at. Yeah. And so, you know, by delaying some of the, the, the hirings through the retirements, it was to provide freedom and flexibility. Just, what is your direction? If, if we had already made those hires, that decreases your choices. Yeah. So uh, we and that's that was not our excuse role. Excuse me, just for a second, Mark. That was really to Greg's earlier point. You know, when I met with Greg, every intention to fill the position at the beginning. Of as we continued through the year and we learned how much overhaul was needed at that middle school schedule, we didn't post the position because we hadn't had this conversation with the board yet. And if we would have posted and filled the position, then there, there is no conversation because then we, we, we've already made that decision. So it's not that we don't want to continue with the high quality music program, it's that we wanted to, the board to have the greatest amount of flexibility. With regard to the document in front of us, 
Uh, I think it would be safe to, if you're asking for some specific direction at this point in time, I think it would be safe to say that the board supports its original commitment to the CEC and would like to see appropriate staffing uh, for that uh, endeavor, for lack of other term. Um, whether that's through, uh, you know, the, the movement of some of the teachers in the cases that you've uh, shown here, from the chain to the elementary school, to the learning center, uh, and if that's in, in consort with what we're attempting to do with both the charter school and our regular district schools, that's fine. We would ask the board to be, I mean the administration as you're going through that, to be cognizant of the fact that, as Dr. Nian pointed out, we don't have unlimited funds. So we have to make smart choices as to how we move forward. Uh, at no point have the board or the administration advocated that we're going to be cutting in any specific areas. We have to, however, be aware of what our financial and fiduciary responsibilities are to the district. Okay. Uh, whether or not there have been rumors about his cutting programs, there has been no decision to cut any programs, nor do I believe it's the intent of the board to give that direction. However, said again, it is our intent to be fiscally responsible. That is one of our duties as being members of this board. Uh, and I think it would be premature to give any specific uh, direction or final direction until we have a bigger picture of what the budget is going forward to include uh, one of the items that is on the agenda for this evening which I believe is following shortly on the item F5 compensation uh, without knowing exactly what that looks out like without knowing what the uh, potential impact <coughs> of additional FTEs over the next two years might look like as uh, offered in this document, um, I think it would be difficult for this board to do any more than give that general commitment that we originally made to the CDC. I'd like to thank you, Mark, for all the work you've done on putting this data together. This is a lot to grapple with and to try to make it so that we can understand the impact of the decisions we'll be making about staffing the district at large is just really, really helpful to have that mind. Good. Can I ask a question? I, I, oh, Sorry, no, you go. You've okay. been waiting. Yeah, I've been waiting. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just trying, I'm just looking in the future, the next four years here, and trying to wrap my head around yep. the staffing. So from our presentation, this is what I understand, just correct me if I'm wrong. So you're looking at a one FTE for next year. Just core teachers that we haven't even finished, but yes. Okay, so, okay, it's so about one. Mm -hmm. And then in 2021, it's two. Mm -hmm. So two, and then in 21, two total, or is no, that no, no. an additional two? So we're up to a total of three. three. And then 21, 22, you're asking for an additional two. No, uh, an additional one, that'd be that eighth grade group. One, okay, so that's four. Okay. The, the fifth equivalent is part of this um, Suzuki Music and, and Aid, or I'm sorry, Aid position, which I know is also on the agenda for the next session as well. But again, th that's all part of this transition from the chain to the CEC that again, as you said, committed to. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with what does that look like from a big picture standpoint. So okay, one, just, two, three, so a total of four. Well, four. Well, we're, FTEs. We're, we're, FTEs, yes. And I was just thinking, we're just thinking, kind of thinking that 75 <coughs> is the equivalent of the fifth FTE. Right? Because okay. if it's 75,000 a year, every year that the CEC is in uh, in charter, it's really the equivalent of teacher salary and benefits. And, and it will be important to hear how some of the things that are being traded yeah I, I want to go back to the kind of the opening statement that, that Greg made and that is simply um, um, you know the options that we have in the big picture 
I think what would be very helpful for us is to uh, take a look at all of our staffing, if we want to go that route. I mean, the CDC doesn't, doesn't work in a vacuum. You, you've made a presentation. We, need, we know we need an extra person there to, to fulfill our commitment. Okay, so the impact of that then on our t entire district for next year, just looking at 1920, um, in terms of FTEs, cost that it'll be for us, we'd like to see that, I'm sure, on paper. And then if you have recommendations that uh, where those cost savings can come in, if it isn't budgetary, just additional money, where that would be. I, I sort of, as Steve said, we're not committed here to mo make much of a decision until we can see that big picture because everybody has a justification for their program and or their teacher. But the point is we, we have to look at that big picture and have all of that data. This is great, but that's that portion of it, okay? So where do we sit in terms of the middle school ban situation? How is that going to factor in? We haven't even talked about the high school yet and how that might factor. We need to know that before we can make a final decision on, on staffing. But I will echo what I said earlier. We're committed to the highest programs we can. Committed to the CEC, committed to all of our programs. And if I had to pick one right now, I would say to um, Greg, um, come back with the number of FTEs we need to keep our men maintained and figure out how we're going to get them on. I have a question. <clears throat> Would there ever be a consideration that um, you would expedite this? I, I know we have three third grade teachers retiring this year. So is there any thought that you know we would bring on first grade and second grade next year into the CEC to? Yeah. So, so now you're really getting into kind of the milieu of what we have been hashing like, over yeah. for, for weeks. Uh, it, and what I'm going to say here is not meant to uh, create a stir or shock anyone. Right. It's, it's just, just thinking out loud. Right. It, the, the district is in a very good financial position. You're, you're only now at the revenue cap. You still have a lot of opportunity for movement within the budget. Mm -hmm. We still have a lot of uh, positions in the district that have gone by the by in many other districts years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, regular education, educational assistance for an example. That's a position that you know has, has been trimmed in other districts. Not because they don't bring value to the table, but because it, it was more important to keep teachers in the classrooms with students, okay? Another option relative to your, your question about the third grade is uh, AGR or SAGE, okay? We're implementing uh, SAGE, which requires a ratio of 18 to one. And again, this is not, you know, I'm not saying this, this is where we're going, but many other districts have moved away from that and they've increased, they've titrated the, the, uh, the ratios of students so that in, instead of 18 to one in kindergarten, you're, you're 20 to one. First grade, you're at 22. Third grade, you're at 24. Fourth grade, you're at 26. And you get, you know, you understand how that progresses. And then what you're doing is you're, uh, you're looking at retirements as another opportunity for attrition. But we've got to do those those calculations if and when the board says yes, we want you to, you know, to to save the FTE or. You know, after you've been at the revenue cap for a couple of years and you've, you know, you've whittled and trimmed uh, opportunities within the budget for some of those big ticket items. I mean, we had a lengthy discussion this morning about this very topic and, you know, I, I, I check in with my, my colleagues here. I, I think we are all of the opinion that the, the district is in sound financial status and we believe that we could absorb those two positions for next year and hold all of the programming as is. But it's it's what's out there in the future that, that really is the great unknown. Well, and what's out there in the future, as you mentioned, is the great unknown in terms of financial support we'll get from the state level, for instance, that right. we never quite know. But we, we being that if we were in this position every year, technically, 
um, well, maybe not every year, because in a two-year budget, we, we kind of know. But we, we have been here many times before over the years, and we have to move forward with the assumption that um, we are going to get some kind of relief. The only difference being we haven't been at the cap. No. Or a big difference, I should say, not the only difference. Yeah. Okay, have we given you enough of a charge to, to try to pull some more of this together from a more global viewpoint? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the other thing we could have done is just presented one year of data instead of the three years of expansion. And I get it, you'd be more comfortable making a decision along those lines, but to be fair to the staff that are impacted by these changes, we wanted to run the numbers ourselves to say where, where we're gonna be at from an FTE standpoint. Like we believe, you know, to, to be responsible to our own staff to make sure that they know that they're gonna be gainfully employed throughout this transition. Right, and so that's why it was presented. I guess when I look back for information along these lines that was given to the board over what that actual FTE increase was going to be, I didn't see any of the details. So I understand there was conversations, but if the conversations is focused on the CEC going from nine staff to maybe ten staff, that was just one part of, of, of the forest looking at that individual tree. What I was trying to do is provide us big picture standpoint looking forward. And I think Dr. Neen spoke. Well, when he said, when we talked about this today as a cabinet, we, we believe that for next year, with potential different revenue sources with the budget and whatnot, but even reallocating sources with, with our current budget, if we maintain FTE and add this one position of, of a core teacher, plus we gotta talk about the music, the change there. So I'm just gonna say for a, argument's sake that you're gonna add two staff next year, replace, uh, retirement, just so we're clear, we think budgetary-wise that'll, that'll work without an issue. And I understand you want us to come back <coughs> with more information to support that recommendation. Right. Because quite frankly, Mark, here's, here's the difference. we want you to be as comfortable with Sorry. it as we will be comfortable with it. The, the difficulty, Pat, is that we may not have all of the information until October. No, there's no question. We don't know exactly what the state's right. going to do. But right now, we've been rather myopic on this one area. We This is what the CEC will look like from number of grades, number right. of teachers. I think what we're asking is the more global picture of the district as a whole. Right. Yeah, so let me be fair. So we did have conversations with Mr. Erskine from the WLC. I mean, that's where these projections came from. The middle school been in contact with them as well, been in contact with the high school, looking at where numbers are at. And, and like I said, I'm comfortable here from these, what I know today, from those projections as far as student course requests go. Okay. You're comfortable here, meaning this is global, this is including high school, this is including middle school? Right, we have to have some conversations on the fine details because student course requests were finalized more recently for some of those areas. Um, but yeah. I mean, the special schedules is already projected for elementary next year, and that's where in that recommendation, there could be a, a cost savings of not replacing uh, Ms. Feld's position at a full time, but rather replacing it at a half time. And again, that was based off conversations I've had with Mr. Esbaumer and Ms. Hare, and them mocking up the schedule with, with some certainties there. But again, before we finalize those things, before I go back to the high school and middle school and say, you got to reduce FTE or you got to stay exactly flat with FTE. We, I needed to have some direction here. Right now, they have been told to stay flat with, with FTE. Don't look for an increase. And, and again, these projections are based off those conversations. So with your conversation with Mr. Beaver, what would you say to him at this point? That'd be a replacement. But, but again, I'm not the one that makes those decisions. I that's understand, what I'm coming I to board. But that's what you're projecting. That is, that is included in this projection, Correct. yes. Correct. And again, th that's the recommendation. What did I, I'm sorry, I, normally we don't go back out to public comment, but you just went like with us. What is that? I, I was just going to, I appreciate you letting me interrupt. Um, the school board said potentially my position would be full, full time replacement. Right. But um, in my little thing earlier tonight, I asked that the board consider. It'd be a full time to stay at the middle school, not be a shared uh, teaching position at the Chandler Charter School. There's never been a conversation about a shared position, so I don't know what that's going to 
We, we, we'll, uh, thank you for mentioning, but we've never heard that either, so right. we'll have to take that into consideration okay. if it ever comes forward. Well, we would appreciate it. So, but, 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 and maybe some of that is in, in um, lack of clarity over this additional request. And, and request may be the wrong term, I just want to be really clear with that. Um, because when you enter an agreement with a charter, equal funding is a big part of this. And so, um, what the CEC is asking for with this additional position, and, and I asked for clarification from the Suzuki music part is, so we gotta come up with those funds to pay for the instructors for Suzuki music. The grant doesn't allow you to apply that towards staff or staffing. So the way a lot of charter schools um, get those dollars to apply for that specialized staffing is by, I'll just say, reallocating their current FTE. So instead of having, let's just say, 60% physical education teacher work with the chain of the CDC, they may want it down to 30% next year. And, and because of the, the charter, and, and being a charter school, you have a little bit more flexibility in your requirements on education delivery. They could uh, not have to, they don't even technically have to have physical education as part of their curriculum or offerings to their students. So that's how that reduction could be. So, so you look at that reduction from a PE standpoint. You can look at that reduction from uh, the recommendation um, music standpoint or from an art standpoint, library meetings. You start looking at where you could, uh, I'm gonna say reduce, but let me be clear, we're reducing time in that building, but we're not looking to reduce teacher contracts by those FTE. So if you have somebody who's out there as a 60%, and through the staffing, and through the, the, the charter agreement, they only need them out there as a 30%. We're not looking to cut somebody's contract by 30%. We would just absorb that 30% into another building because again, as what's laid out here for next year and the next couple of years, there's gonna be additional sections shifted to the WLC. So it's not a cost savings to the district of, of, of that reallocation of funds. However, we have to be cognizant that of that charter there's an equal funding part. And so to be able to, to offer that um, Suzuki music program, for example, which is a great attractor and what makes the CDC a unique option in, in charter school within our area, we have to figure out how, how to pay for it. And so maybe that's where some of those conversations have come from. And again, we're, we've never had the conversation of shared staff along those lines to make those things happen. We've had conversations over what is that dollar amount and how do we actually get there look like and what are those figures going to be and, and trying to project that forward as much as possible because the other part of it is the charter school being project based if those students and their projects deviate from what we traditionally offer uh, we might have to offer some things different out there and so there, there needs to be that flexibility that's built into a charter school especially one that's project based as well but i can certainly tell you from from our conversations uh, for next year the request is for roughly $75,000 to um, pay for that Suzuki Music FTE and also uh, an instructional aid to provide support to students so that they can still have um, a world language opportunity, some physical education opportunities, and some makerspace opportunities. Okay, we, can, we can move on to that request in a moment, but I, I will circle back to again based on what we have rep indicated to you here. Do you have what you need? to provide us with, in consort with a business manager, the global look of, from a budgetary standpoint, from an FTE standpoint, where you would project we will be next year, based on the direction we've given you. That direction is the continued support of the CEC, i.e. one FTE if that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is continued, we, we are not at liberty to spend endlessly, period. But we do want to support our students in all ways we reasonably can and should for their education. So we're, we're not gonna parse on whether or not it's this one, because I believe based on what you're representing, and we still haven't even gotten into what the salaries will be going forward. But again, that's a global thing. But I think we've represented to you that we are going to give that commitment, or we believe that commitment will indeed be there once we've seen the global impact. Fair enough? Fair enough. Is that enough from your perspective? Yours? 
and yours and your staff's. Okay, thank you. All right, that brings us up to uh, the CEC Educational Assistant uh, part-time request. Hi everyone, uh, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity from everyone at the CEC and kind of the journey that we've been on. It's been um, really fulfilling for all of us and have been involved and so the board is responsible for that, so thank you. Um, I wanted to kind of sh talk to you about the memo. So in front of you, I wanted to give a background about what Suzuki Method is and then how we came to this program for our students and um, you know the fact that what Mark was saying historically our charter schools are offering different uh, methods for teaching they're offering flexible schedules and so what happens for our students in our classrooms is that in the morning it's very much traditional they have language arts and they have math um, and then in the afternoon they break out for their project time and that's when they really do all of their projects and so right now the project cycle and as Sandy said the last one was a musical right now the project cycle is project lead the way which is our engineering curriculum that we were able to purchase for our grant funding and so that is something that is a gift for with having a charter school we're awarded that flexibility for our students and Part of our vision and mission when we were originally creating the school was to make sure that our kids can explore our passions and or their passions and seek out what those passions might be and so part of our responsibility as the governance council and as the leaders of that school is to find what those passions may be and so when we started the church school i know that um, when we had our community meetings the idea of having an orchestra and string orchestra came up repeatedly and so that is something that we set out when we wrote the grant application to um, the state of Wisconsin for the federal dollars. We wrote in the Suzuki program. And this <coughs> was done because we were recommended them because they are out in the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. It's one of the only programs that partners with a college or university. And um, it's the Suzuki method is an internationally recognized method for teaching music. And so how it differs from other instruction is that it bases its approach on a linguistic scale. So as kids are picking up language, that is how they're treating music like it is also a language. And so they're, that is, they start by listening and then as and they're listening to other people, they're listening to themselves, they're one-on-one -on -one instruction, they encourage, highly encourage parent participation, so oftentimes parents are learning the instrument along with the student, which is also so integral to what we've been trying to do. Um, we, as part of our grant application, it was, and, and also the community conversation. I know that parents want to be involved. They want more options besides PTG. They want real options. And this was something that struck us as well as we were learning about the program. The other main thing that really got me was the philosophy of Suzuki. So the philosophy is that every child can. So you, it's the idea that people like me are capable of doing it even though I was growing up believing that I am not musically gifted. And so the idea is that no matter who you are and no matter what your background is, you can learn to play music and you can have that power in your hands. And so that was something that for our students, I think with how we wrote the grant and um, our vision and where we see the culture of the school going and what we want for our students and that option to, to, to give them that option to understand what that is and not um, not in, in an environment where it may not be attainable for some, and, but attainable for others. And so that is kind of how we got to that. Um, when I think it struck everyone is when we invited Suzuki to come out to Chain Elementary. 
last May. And if you scroll down on the memo, we included pictures of this event. Um, they put on what they called a musical petting zoo. And so every kid in the school uh, came down in groups and in sections, and they were able to sit with a Suzuki trained instructor and actually play the instruments. And I think, <laughs> every time, I'm sorry, <laughs> there's one particular student that my son has gone to chain since 4K. And so there's one student that I always think about when I think about this is that he struggles to, I'm sorry, he struggles to engage on a daily basis. And he struggles socially, he struggles emotionally. And I saw him sit in a teacher's lab and I saw him, I, I saw a facial expression I had never witnessed. And I'm not saying he's never had it at chain, I have never witnessed it. And so it was incredibly powerful and in that moment I thought, this kid has to have this program. And every kid needs to have the program and or have access to it. And so what we did is we, um, we looked at possible options for how to pay for this and fund this program and bring it to our school. We talked about um, looking for grant dollars. We talked about having parents pay a portion. We talked about so many different options. At one point, I was scratching my head wondering if it was gonna happen. And so what has gone on is that we have been with WORKS and with um, the grant application, we have been involved in so many trainings. We have been connected with charter schools across, uh, across the state. I went to the National Charter School Convention and talked to so many different charter schools around the nation. And the common theme was that for programs like this, when you're looking for sustainability and you're looking for something that's going to last, and you're not trying to put something on the governance council where they have to raise an exorbitant amount of funds every year and wonder where it's gonna come from, they started looking within. And so we started looking at what do we have in our budget? What are our options? And so it's it was not a light situation. It was just that we want it all. And we love PE. We think it's incredible for our students. We want them to be outside. We want them to have those opportunities. And so how do we get that and still have Suzuki funding? And so when we were looking at everything, the things that we had to give up were library, some of traditional music, and um, our PE. And eventually, we will eliminate hot lunch to also recoup some funds to pay for this. And so it was months of deliberation. It was not light. Um, the money that we're asking for is the money that has been traded out for equal funding. And much like Mark said, they're not reductions. Um, so I, I don't want to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, but you know, as we're looking here and seeing what are our options, this is what we're looking to do. And um, so part of this recommendation is to ask for the aid that Mark also mentioned. So our aid would then run a PE class. It would, they would run um, our foreign language, which we currently have plans to do online um, and use online programs. And then we would um, use them for FACE and then, um, one of my friends, oh, our makerspace lab. That, and, and all of that is in the grant as well. And so what I want you guys to also know is that in our grant, I wrote the program in, but we also wrote in the cost of all of the instruments. And so this really is our opportunity and our funding period, we have to, we have to spend all of our money from year one, probably to claim it and do everything we need to do, probably the end of April to be careful. And so all of those instruments, $30,000 worth of instruments are in that first year. And so that is something that we can offer the students and there won't be a cost to anyone. We can go to parents and say, this is what your child is gonna do, we're requiring it third through sixth, it's not a cost to you. No strings attached. So, <laughs> I think of that in there. Anyways, but um, so we're asking for the recommendation of the aid 
and that is our future plan. I'm happy to answer questions. I also um, included as much as I could about um, what Suzuki has to offer. It has much more than I've just said, so forgive me, I get very nervous. So <laughs> thank you. So questions and concerns, anything? Any questions? I have just one comment. <coughs> We're in the very early stages, excuse <coughs> me, and I know Sandy and I have talked to you briefly about this, and I've talked to the, the board has talked about it, but we're looking down the road as a possibility of entering into an agreement with the city on a Fund 80 program. Fund 80, which would allow us to offer programs within our district <coughs> and be the taxing entity and work with the city for either summer programs or programs very similar to what you're talking about, the Suzuki program. Um, that's an avenue in terms of uh, increase in funding that we're just just beginning to explore. Okay, it might be something that will be very helpful in the future if we move in that direction. So um, I'm, I'm telling that and I'm telling everybody that, that we're looking at that because I think it's important for you to know that we are exploring other avenues of how we can, we can in fact fund programs just like you're talking about. And maybe additional programs we haven't even thought about yet that somebody else would come in and, and we would recognize it as a, a extremely positive for our district. And this might be one way we can look at that. Just a comment about Fund 80. Fund 80 could not support like classroom projects. Right. Now, Lena does have an after school program for right. their elementary, <coughs> I think, through third grade or third through fifth. It's an after school program that they fund through Fund 80, and Aaron Jensen and I are actually going to visit with the right. director of that to find out more. It's, it's an but extension. As it's a, a supplement that might be extended. I mean, if we want to go down the Fund 80, funding road, it, it could be something that would make Suzuki more accessible, more widely within the district. Right, yeah. It's something that, again, we're just exploring and all the ins and outs of it, but it is it is an avenue that we have not tapped into in the past, but hopefully it is something that we could use and it would, as, as Sandy said, it would simply promote, mitigate, and help with the, the whole concept. And that would only be one program. There might be others out there that would be of a similar nature. However, we really can't go into detail on that since it's not on the agenda. No. <laughs> the types of things that might be considered. So yeah. Yeah. under uh, regulatory constraints, we'll end the, okay. any Fund 80 discussions at that point. Well said. Well said. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, any questions? Yes. I, I'm just trying to put a couple things together. So this part-time educational system at the CEC, <coughs> Is it, is, it, is it an educational assistant or is this a, a teacher? Some, it would be an educational assistant pay scale. The person would not be required to have a Wisconsin teaching license in that field. Um, but in the job description, we could write things like we have in there that they should have a college education, be able to get these standards and implement them. So I guess it's more qualifications required than we typically write in the job description for an education. Yeah, and I understand that charter schools you know, operate under a different set of guidelines than, than the public schools. So would this educational assistant be assisting another uh, a, a certified um, educator, or would this educational assistant actually be taking uh, the kids in, a, let's say, if it was a Phi Ed class, would they be with a Phi Ed teacher, or would they just be taking these kids? No, there would be no Phi Ed teacher. They could be under the the direction of a one of the district by a teachers, but there would be no by a teacher present. Yeah, I, and I just want to bring this up because we were talking about summer school, and I think that we've all talked about people who were teaching different classes in the summer school. I think the board's consensus was we, we really want certified teachers teaching the, the certain classes that required certifications. I know we talked about that before to make sure that we have the proper training in those positions. It's, it, it's a sticky slope when we start getting into um, hiring teachers who um, do not have the credentials because if we start doing that here, you know, where is that going to stop? So that's my only concern about having somebody I don't think you're certified. allowed by law to do that in the traditional school. So I know not by law you're not required. But I mean, no, you're not, you're not allowed, allowed to hire someone. 
only in a charter school. In only in charter school. You could never do that in, in charter school. Well, well, even if it doesn't uh, spread here, what, what's, what stops you from at the charter school to bring in more than that? Certainly allowable and the prerogative of the CEC Governance Council to decide those kinds of things. I know there are charter schools, for example, who bring in um, people who may not have a music certification to come and teach strings to their students or have other expertise, but not the degree. Um, I understand your concern, Mark, and I, you know, we do have the measures that will be evaluating the CEC each year on to see if they're reaching those, those goals and targets. Um, As I would have to emphasize with what Sandy is saying that while the charter school has a significant level of autonomy, we have the responsibility to monitor uh, that the education they are providing is in line with the school's mission. Um, and uh, so yeah, there's, there's, they do have the autonomy, but we have some responsibility as the grantor, or I mean, as the authorizer of the charter school. So um, I, I think that's a little bit of what Sandy's talking about here as yeah. to where they, under contract, can make some of these types of decisions, but we ultimately have to make sure that the result of decisions they've made are providing the education that uh, is expected. Or not, but it, it did in my mind. Yeah. I think I'm a little surprised to see that there were, there's a request for a, a motion to approve an, a part time educational assistant of the CDC by our board. That's not my number. <laughs> no, I, I think that's more of a, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's more of a uh, request that everybody's on board with what their decision has been or the direction that they're choosing. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I guess I contacted Carol on what the proper procedure was, and she said when you're adding a new position that didn't exist before, it always should come to you. Well, under normal circumstances, that would be the case. If the charter so contract, that's why if the charter, charter contract doesn't require that, uh, in normal position, <coughs> that's what would because they're still employees of the district, and we just want to make sure we're on the same page with everybody. I, I guess, from my perspective, I'm glad to have this information and have a chance to respond as to whether I thought this was a violation of the contract. And if it's not, then that would be where I would weigh in. It doesn't seem to be a violation of the contract. And at this point, we aren't looking at a job description anyway. Well, and, and if I'm, uh, unless I'm reading this incorrectly, we're, we're adding, or the Chain Exploration Center is adding an, an instructional assistant. Is that the title? Yes. Well, we have instructional or educational assistants all the time that we don't have to vote on, do we? We don't have to. Because they're put into the consent agenda. If it's an additional position, it's a high you level. vote to add an additional Oh, I get it. <coughs> so we didn't have not not any. Do. I get it. If it's an additional one, yeah. All right. But whether we, I guess this is this is actually one of the reasons that I thought competency number four in that workshop just seems so perfect to just determine where some of these lines are because the our our job descriptions are part of the policy manual. Uh, anyway. <laughs> realizing that the CEC has a bit of a deadline due to the grant, if I'm understanding all of that correctly, uh, I would entertain a motion that might be something along the lines of, if appropriate and necessary under the contract, I would move. If appropriate and necessary under the contract, I would, I would move that we approve the addition of a 
position that is an educational assistant not to exceed 17 hours per week. Not to, no, I was just thinking in terms of a description that might be different, to adding a position description to the position descriptions in our policy manual. But are you looking for, if it's appropriate under a contract, I move to approve the addition of a part-time educational assistant to the CDC, not to exceed 17 hours per week. Yeah, I, the reason I'm, I'm suggesting that if a motion is to be brought forward, that it be brought forward that way. Without the contract in front of us right now, it does, you have to have that in front of you. But I'm not sure that if, I, I was looking at it and yes. yeah. Yeah, I opened it up to, oh. CEC shall, this is um, in section four, governance structure of the school, 4.2 governance, autonomy, and council membership. So I'll skip about the council membership, but there is a section, and this is taken directly from the statutes. The CEC shall have autonomy and decision-making authority over the following. Um, includes expenditures of allocated budgets, grant funds, and funds donated specifically to the CEC, curriculum and instruction, policies and procedures specifically unique to the daily operation of the school that are not addressed in existing CEC policies. But I, I think the curriculum instruction and expenditures of allocated budgets are probably key there. And then when we get down to employment. So, but if the employment payment comes out of the grant proposal, Funded. Then we don't. It won't. Okay. But there are sections. Yeah. It won't. Um, all hiring and staffing decisions shall be made by the SDW School District Board well, Packet Board of Education in accordance with the decision of the CECGC. Okay. And then they talk about a hiring committee, and then this is actually has to do with hiring candidates they've interviewed, and they just simply give the names to the board and the board says. Much like a consent agenda item like that we might have. Agenda. And that's where they've been placed in the past. There are sections, let's see. So do you want to make a motion to that effect? I do. I, I, I mean, it's still said, on the table. Yeah, it's if it's appropriate to the contract, and I think, I think we can look. I want to get this. Yeah, I, if, with the motion that you've made, we would take the time to review the contract to see if it's required approval. If it is, and your motion is passed, then that approval has, it, has been given. If, however, upon further review of the contract, rather than a brief review, right. it is not required, since you said if appropriate, it would not actually be a in an active motion as such. That's why the qualifier on it. I'll second your motion. Motion and second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. Motion passes. Item F5, compensation for 2019 and 20. So just a little bit of <clears throat> background for the board. Um, yeah, we've uh, got $10 million more or less uh, salaries for our, our teaching staff. Uh, when you fold in uh, the other staff, secretaries, custodial, uh, educational assistants, therapists, administrators, you're looking at uh, a total wage uh, line item in the budget of just over $14 million. 
So with the uh, implementation, or uh, so not the implementation, but with the uh, notification of CPIU at 2.44%, uh, the administration put together uh, three costing options. Uh, a 2% increase, which has a, a total packet or a total increase to the budget of just under $300,000. Um, a 2.25 increase, which is uh, an impact of $333,000 and some change. And then uh, to implement CPIU <coughs> at 2.44% uh, brings in uh, 359, uh, almost $360,000. So there's a, a fair amount of, of, of information there. Um, and you know, if the board is, is ready to, to move forward, but we'll, we'll take our direction tonight. If the board wishes to uh, have this item return at a meeting <coughs> next week, uh, certainly can do that as well. Does the, do the numbers uh, take into account the uh, decisions that we made tonight in terms of additional staffing? No, that's, that, that, was, that was based on a snapshot right now. Okay. Is that accurate, Carl? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Yeah. That's the typical yeah, I'm just curious. Okay, we've got uh, three levels of uh, potential increase in compensation listed here. Uh, we certainly, as Dr. Neon pointed out, are not uh, necessarily required to make a decision here and now on the specific level. Um, realizing that the projections or castings are always a bit uh, liquid, if you will, uh, because it does not take into consideration all uh, the things such as the addition of uh, one FTE or a partial uh, aid for the, or educational assistant for the CEC of 17 hours, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Personally, I would like to see what the rest of the budget is looking like before we make a specific decision on what we might elect here, but that's my own personal thoughts. Obviously, this uh, board has, uh, if, they, if they would like to pursue something at this point in time, certainly may. Well, I just would like to ask a little bit of expenses with a little understanding of revenue. It seems premature to be voting on. The tricky part there, Dimitri, is that you know, contracts typically come out around May, and you may not know what your budget is until sometimes October. So you can either you know, freeze salaries and give a contract for the same amount as, as it was this year, and then go back and issue new contracts and you know, do catch up pay uh, when the budget becomes known. Uh, or forward and do you feel that you have less information than usual at this point about what the budget looks like? Um, I don't think so. I think it's just you, know, you, you haven't been at the cap before. And so you know you had that flexibility, you had that room to increase the levy should you need it. Do you think are you more optimistic though because of our governor? Oh, certainly, absolutely, yeah. It, and you know, it's not going to be a one-sided budget. It's not going to be all education. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you have divided mm -hmm. government, and said right. this frequently, mm -hmm. uh, you get moderation. Yeah. So, Carl Hayek, um, do you, do you want to make any recommendations here, or any thoughts from your perspective on where we sit at this point? I told you, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> You're the money man. I would just say that, um, you know, I, I always give a budget snapshot, and it's usually late in June, but usually by that time, um, the salaries are in play. The salaries are usually in play by May uh, before we release the district, and uh, the consumer price index is what it is. It's 2.44, and I think that in, uh, you know, that's probably the number to work work from. And, um, you know, as we get further into it, uh, of course, we don't know our, we won't know our revenues uh, 
portfolio till October, probably late in October, perhaps if uh, the legislature can't agree, it could even be delayed uh, longer. Uh, one of the things I could do is I can put the conservative estimate uh, and flat line it and uh, you know, show you where the revenue cap is in, in that direction and we'll go forward with that, a real simple snapshot. In, um, but there's other areas of the budget that we're out, we look at every year behind the scenes. And one of the things we're hoping to look at is not a $140,000 food service operation transfer going forward from henceforth. So, and be other, we'll, we'll look at all the purchasing services, we look at all our contracts, and so there, there's, you know, anytime you increase this, like last year, 2.5%, there's a reduction someplace else going on behind the scenes, uh, perhaps in maintenance, perhaps in uh, not necessarily in utilities, but there is all, we're always looking for savings elsewhere, so. Um, I think that's what the board is, or at least some members of the board are requesting at this point, okay. is you may not be in a position to give any absolutes, especially on the revenue side, but largely on the expense side, what your projections might be. Uh, no, you don't know what the cost of uh, oil per barrel will be, 2020 uh, and therefore what the cost to heat these buildings will be but I think if you can give a reasonable uh, as you put it flat line projection with any known increases necessary due to facilities uh, whether it's through the capital expenditures that you may be projecting uh, on a normal maintenance schedule or any other items uh, such as the change in food services with the uh, decision to try well to leave, uh, those types of things. If you could give us that, that initial look, it would be very helpful before we can make uh, an informed decision with what we might be projecting. Absolutely, and one of the things will be, we're, this Friday, we're, we're, we're getting close to negotiating our health insurance as well, and that's, that'll play into it. We're, we're uh, uh, projecting as no increase, so, uh, right. but if that goes up, fluctuates a little, that'll be a known entity. Yeah, okay. absolutely. All right, is that satisfactory to the board? Yeah. When do you need to have a decision by? <coughs> well, you know, I, I think we'd, we'd like to stay on the same calendar that we've, we've been on and that the staff has been accustomed to and we'll issue the contracts in, in May so that you know, when they leave, they, they can plan accordingly. So could we ask then then following up on that, that we bring the same issue back a month from now? Would that be enough time for you to put together some information for us? You're saying May, correct? No, I'm April, saying April. April. You wouldn't have, I mean, you even wouldn't if necessarily it's on the have the insurance aspect at that point. Correct, it's getting close and uh, the property insurance and uh, the insurance. Re realizing there may be some factors that you don't have readily available right. if you uh, either flatline them based on uh, your experience in that specific category, or if you even apply at 2.5, uh, due to the fact that yes, uh, there's there's a likelihood that that kind of service uh, may go up, or that type of utility may go up based on historical, and there's no guarantees. But we're just trying to get a bigger picture before we can uh, dissect into this area. And if it's on the agenda for April, and we're just like tonight, and we don't have still have more information, we can always move it back. But we might be able to have some more conversation about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll have that for April meeting. Mm -hmm. and, and, didn't we also have some discussions that there were some things that were going to be brought back when we were determining the budget for next year relative to some groups? Or yes. Okay. Will that be the next meeting? Is the next meeting also. Yeah. So the second half of this uh, compensation memo is, is only germane to uh, the teachers. Uh, at the beginning of this school year, some of the uh, WTA officers had approached the administration and asked if there might be an opportunity for uh, those of our, our most veteran staff members who have uh, accrued the, the advanced degrees and the maximum number of credits and the maximum number of years and we're in that lower right hand corner if there was an opportunity to take the uh, stipend or institute participation and roll that amount into their contract amount for the subsequent year 
and the board will probably recall that in a number of years past you've, uh, you've implemented a $500 one-time payment for those staff members who are in that cell and only realize a $68 increase from one year to the next. So the, the task uh, brought to us was to figure out if, uh, if we could do that and if it would be sustainable. And so uh, we've, we've made some calculations and um, this is a depiction of, of, of how it, it does become sustainable. So um, in this example, we've got $11 million uh, for, for salaries. If the board implements CPIU in this example and it's 2.5%, then the amount of money that would be going into that, that salary structure would be $275,000. So hold that number aside for just a moment and then uh, realize that we've got 33 teachers that are in that lower right-hand cell that are essentially stuck. If all 33 of them participated in the institute and were eligible for the, the $500 stipend, that would come out to approximately $16,500. So if you take that $16,500 from the $275,000, now you've accounted for that money rolling forward year after year but the amount that's going to be invested back into the matrix is no longer 275,000, it's now 258,500. So that makes the, the impact more of a 2.35% than an actual 2.5%. So that's how, that's how we believe that this, uh, this request can be achieved and, and is sustainable and is a uh, a great option and opportunity for our most veteran staff members who realize a small amount of growth in that in that final uh, cell area. So one of the things that I did over the last couple of months is I took this explanation out to all of the buildings, all of the staff members, and then I asked them at the conclusion of, of our time together to get in touch with their union officers and their representatives and indicate an up or down, um, would it be supported by the masses? And you know, as Corey is in the audience tonight, he indicated that the uh, support was more than two to one in favor of, of this option. Do you know, maybe Corey, you know what percentage of our teachers are in the I don't know. Over 60%. Over 60%. So, but the other 40% are not surveyed or they so are? So, Dr. Dean did direct all staff to discuss with building officers their point of view whether they were meeting or not. Okay. And everybody had an opportunity to do so. Okay. And not everybody elected to do that, but everybody had an opportunity. Everybody at every building knew who the officers were because the doctor needed to make a point to say, please go and talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Corey, maybe you could explain just as, in the specific, if, if you follow this model um, in terms of, and you're one of those 33 people down at the bottom, what kind of percentage then would that person receive uh, based upon uh, uh, that the model here in terms of it starts out at 2.5, then we see a 2.35. What about the person who's frozen in? What kind of percentage are they looking at? I think we did that calculation at one point, and it was right around 1%. It wasn't, it wasn't, yeah, it, I don't know that it was 1%. Yeah, it it was, was, uh, you're talking $500. Right, you're talking $500. For someone so that's down in that corner. Right. Plus whatever might have generated through. 80% Pardon? It's about 0.8%, less than 1%. Okay. Thank you. I'm a mathematician. <laughs> and again, kids, the importance of math. <laughs> Just wondering, yeah. curious. So the, the board can certainly act on this at the same time, um, but we wanted to share that information. So. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions? 
Okay, they're being done. Uh, moving on to monitoring. I wonder if we might take just a, a real brief break. Maybe. Uh, yes, we consider ourselves on break. Um, 15 minutes. Well, we got to come back to that anyway. Okay, we're to the section of the meeting for monitoring, and this is technology updates. Um, I'm a little fearful of the fact that they have VR goggles here uh, because if uh, we have those on and you're recording, Lord always know what only knows what it's going to look like. That's said, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, hey, thanks. I don't get to talk to you very often, and I'll try to keep it short. I think my dog has texted me a few times, letting me know that we're supposed to be watching some show right now. Um, well, I don't know, I, whatever, Bachelorette, I think. <laughs> All right, so uh, we just wanted to go through, I've got some slides, I just want to go through some, hit on some points of things we've done so far this year, and then I want to introduce a few folks to you. One of the things we've done this year is we implemented Gaggle, which is for our mental health for our students. And what that does is it basically runs an algorithm on our students' email and on their Google Drive to search for key phrases of, of suicide, self-harm, things of that set nature. And then it documents it for us. And I think one of the most important parts of this is it's allowed for these conversations to happen between either our admin and our students or our counselors and our students. So there's violations where if they're looking up inappropriate material or they're typing inappropriate things, it'll send them an email, hey, you're violating the acceptable use policy, you know, please don't do this again. And then there's other ones where it's self-harm where we have the guidance counselors or the admin reach out to those students within 24 hours if it's not a super serious event. And that way they have these conversations where we have documented. And then we've had some serious events, events that I think we've had two where we've been able to reach students where some certain situations have happened that we would not have known otherwise on things it does. So it's just part of a, something we're trying to do to put that mental health for our students. All right, some of the highlights from this year so far. Through the safety grant, through DOJ-1 and DOJ-2, we've been able to purchase 50 new surveillance cameras that have been deployed throughout the district. We've also been able to build three new video servants, uh, surveillance <coughs> servers, which is, allows us to hold information longer than we have been before. So if we were only able to hold information on videos for like 30 days previously, we've been able to double and triple that amount so that we were able to hold the information longer. We also, just to prove today that we, this is, we figured out how to get this officially done, was there's gonna be a new entrance for the students here at the high school that'll look exactly like the district en entrance. So that way it'll be a buzz system. It'll be over in the student section over there where they park, and they'll have to be buzzed in when they come late, and there'll be a TV monitor just like there is now in the main office where they'll get let in. And that'll alleviate some of the problems that when we talked with previous principals and current principals, of students coming in later in the day as they come in and out to kind of reduce some of that traffic from students parking out in this area. Steve, when you say there are 50 new surveillance cameras, um, are those 50 uh, uh, old sites and just new equipment? No. So this would be like the chain didn't have any. So this would be putting a whole new system in at the chain inside and outside. It would be replacing some of the older ones that aren't maybe like a 4K quality. So the quality has been upgraded in all of the other ones that we've been working on and to try to cover all the dead spots that we still had within the district. Okay. Also, we've just implemented Wii Video for all students to use with their Chromebooks and this will allow them to do video creation any place, anytime, anywhere, but still be underneath the umbrella of the district. It's basically a program that runs on their Chromebook in the background in the cloud so that way they'll have that opportunity. So whether it's on their phone, whether it's on their Chromebook, they'll be able to turn that into Google um, the Classroom so that way they can work seamlessly with their teacher on that. That's always been something we've been asked about is how can we do easy video creation? And that's probably the easiest tool that we can use with still being able to get that piece accomplished. 
for with me, uh, if you would. Maybe the others are familiar with it, but WeVideo would be... WeVideo would be using any kind, it's a video editing program. Okay. So they could use their phone, they could use a camera, they can use the camera on their Chromebook okay. to record themselves. They also could just record their screen. So if they wanted to give a demonstration to a teacher of okay. what they're thinking, it can record the screen. It can also do a webcast. Okay, I wasn't clear if it was uh, a FaceTime or uh, Skype or whatever type thing to communicate or if it was video capture. Yep, video capture. Thank you. Also, some of the grants we've been able to do this year through the state of Wisconsin, the Personal Electronics Computing Grant, that's for freshmen, that's for helps our one-to-one -one program. For every freshman that's in our district, we get $125. That's gonna be good for the next four years. We're using that to help offset our one-to-one -one program at the freshman level. So like this year, that accounted for $19,350, and then we were able to apply that to the Chromebooks that we bought. Now the way that grant works is, is it's we, they give us that much, we have to match it. And so that works out perfect for our one-to-one -one program because that, that'll cover it then. Well, we pay for half, that covers the other half. We were also lucky enough to get round 13, am I right on that? Round 13 WTI grant. And this is for $20,000 for maker spaces at the WLC and at the middle school. So that stuff has mainly been purchased and it's starting to roll out. And you think you're gonna be pretty excited when you see some of those cool things that they're gonna be able to do with some of the new technologies. We also purchased 15 Khajiit hotspots for students that can check out that they don't have internet. So if this would be more in the rural areas where they don't have that access, they can check these out from the library and they can still do their work from home. And it's worked out pretty nice. We had them start checking out second semester. They've been used pretty consistently. And they do, we did put some limits on them so that way they couldn't just run them nonstop because we do pay for the, the bandwidth. And then we have it shut off at certain times because that was one of the things we felt that we didn't want students using these after midnight and we didn't think that they needed to have that, but we wanted to make sure they still have that access, which has helped us in a few in incidents, 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 so far this year where we've had students that have had to, maybe have had some kind of issues where they're working outside the school, where they've been able, we've been able to work with parents so that way they're able to continue that education. Steve, do you have any idea what the percentage of our students is that uh, do not have internet service at home? It's close to 30%. Yeah. So one out of three. Yes. We also were able to, through E-Rate, we were able to purchase a new Wi-Fi access controller that'll be going online, that'll just help prevent some of the future things that we were gonna run into with the more devices we add on and on. Do these uh, hotspots, do they prevent them from uh, utilizing that to just like watch YouTube videos or surf Facebook and stuff, they actually have to use it for homework? Yep, the way we set it up is they have a, a dashboard, Kajit does, that I log into and I set up what it could do. Okay. So that way it was like no social media. I did let YouTube go, but it basically, if you use more than 250 megabytes, it basically is done for the day. So they're, they're told that. And so if you just sit and watch videos, it's gonna chew right through that really quick. And it says you hit your limit for the day. You find that they're all, almost always all rented out or all checked out? Like Not all, but we have had in we, probably half at a time. So out of the 15, probably seven or eight. What do you think the percentage of students are is at the high school that has a uh, cell phone with, um, internet. internet. I'd have to look. Um, we'd have to kind of map that out, what Do that looks like. Do you think most like. of them, or? I think I can't answer that for really? sure. Okay. Maybe Abigail would like to weigh in on how many students at <laughs> the high school have a cell phone. Huh? Um, I'd say it's probably a great majority, but um, it's also probably less than you guys might think. Like with the mod, like the modern generation, um, there's still actually quite a few students who I see with like flip phones or like no phones at all. Um, so I'd say probably close to like 75, 80 percent do have cell phones. Um, but with that, there's also like if you're doing um, homework, um, sometimes it won't let you log into your school account, like your school email account, and so therefore you can't get into the classroom either, which is where a lot of our homework is stored. Mm -hmm. So you really can't do your homework on your phone sometimes, unless you have like a separate server you're going through. Right. So you'd have to use your Chromebook. Yeah, Chromebook or a laptop or a computer or something okay. along. Yeah. Thank you. So we've converted from the dog ate my homework yeah. to <laughs> my phone ate my homework. Yeah. Or the dog ate my phone. Mm -hmm. yeah.
So let's ask Abby about you. Like, do you have internet service at your house? Um, I got it last year, yeah. Before that, I didn't have it. Okay. So what would you have done if you didn't have it? Would you have to resort to um, what we're talking about here and take one home? or? Um, when I didn't have it, I, di I didn't know these didn't exist until like five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> so I there might wouldn't have done that. Um, I would just end up yeah, coming to school early or staying late to get my homework done, which um, would have made more problems for my parents having to come get me because I didn't have my license. And one of the nice things about the Chromebooks is you can work with them offline, but you obviously can't access the internet. Mm -hmm. But you could do all the work ahead of time and then bring it in and it would be fine. Mm -hmm. What we're looking for currently here in the short term future is we're out to RFP right now for our new printing solution. So we've got that laid out. March 31st is the deadline for those. Those have been presented. And then we'll present those with the, the group that we have looking at them. There's been a whole group of teachers and, and staff that have been working on that for about four or five months already, so that's pretty exciting. We've also worked with the business department to create a long-term solution to our one-to-one -one program that's sustainable for many years to come, but that's out there. We're updating all of our computers to Windows 10 this summer, and we're also inventory of all of our devices and technology within the district that will hopefully be completed by the end of summer, so all those will be logged into our Destiny Resource Manager. That's a quick question. When you talk about the long-term Correct. Because are we leasing them now? Correct. And is that now they're going to be on a? When we lease them, we know what the projected cost is every single year, so we can lock that in. Versus saying, right now there's a, a shortage on chips for Intel, so next year's devices will all cost more. But if we lease, we can also know that this is what it's going to cost us per year going forward every single year. And with the Chromebooks, they're really only good for five years, and so on a four-year on four-year cycle, then we're definitely able to make those efficient and make sure that we can sustain that long-term versus saying we're going to buy a bunch of them right now and then we're going to buy a bunch more in five or six years and we're going to hope that that gets there. And it really ends up being a probably better deal for us in the long run because then we're able to sell those back at a, at a rate, five, six thousand dollars we'll get back at the end of those four or five years that we can put back into it. Steve, when a freshman comes in and gets a, a Chromebook, do they keep the same Chromebook for four years? Yes. And um, uh, are, what happens at the end of the school year? This year, we're going to collect them. So what will happen is we need to inventory them because we don't have that. Last year, they were able to take them home. What we'll, what we'll do is we'll inventory them, st uh, sticker them, tag them, and make sure that we know who's got them so that way we get everything back. Now going forward, what we want to make sure is like in August, we have students that start AP classes. So we want to make sure if they want to come check them out, they can definitely come check them out before they have to do that. And if they're in summer school, we will have a set available to them to check out to still be able to use. But not necessarily their own. Might not be their own. Might be one of the older ones at that point, just to use for the summertime. And then they would get their other ones back. And that's pretty common, because of what they try to do is, that's two or three months where they're not used and we know that they're not maybe in the back of a truck and we may we know that they're going to end up back at school versus a student leaves and also we did there's nothing we could do it's like a lost textbook at that time <coughs> where we would just have to eat that cost and last year we lost 15 devices when they got to take them home all summer and it took a long time for us to track those down and most of them we did not get back so that's just that other part of, of how do we keep the resources in the district now for the fun part. So I want to introduce probably three of the rock stars here in Wapaka among many that the district has who have definitely made my, my nine months here better because they've been able to be a, a great <laughs> sounding pause. board. Long pause there. They've, had, they've been a good sounding board. They've, they're great leaders. And um, they stayed here for a couple hours. So Crystal Vita, Art Schultz, and Stephanie Knuth, they're our tech integrators for the district at the different levels. And what they're going to do is, and I, and I hope you participate in this, is they're, we're going to go on a little VR field trip. And they're going to demonstrate some of these merging technologies and how you, we can use some of these in the classroom and the, the different curriculums. So I'll let them take over. And actually, we have uh, Patty Kemper working with the third graders uh, on, a, uh, on a VR field trip uh, in, I don't know how long ago this one, this particular image was taken up. But we've 
been using the, this particular set for a little bit more than a year. Did you wipe out all of the little little? <laughs> yes, the kids clean them every single time they use them. Yeah, I make them share a wipe between four kids to maximize our. Um, <laughs> so if you don't know what virtual reality is, I'll just kind of fill this in. Vir virtual reality or VR is a 3D sim simulation of a real world environment, uh, or maybe even a make, make believe. Uh, it could be something as simple as there are even ports of virtual reality even for Minecraft <coughs> are more fun games out there. Um, but when we think about, we have transportation problems in the district being able to go to some places, and Virtual reality gives us an opportunity to take our students somewhere else. Um, sometimes it allows us to take, a, take places in history, it allows us to take, take them places that we're not gonna be able to get that international flight for our students. I'm sorry, it's just not gonna happen. Um, so our, our, VR, our VR headsets are powered by the Google Expeditions application, and uh, which has over 900 simulations, and there's more on the way. Um, and there's other things going on with that anyway. So. I'm gonna try to switch into the mode of getting things up and rolling um, and making sure the simulation is working. So we're gonna <laughs> the whole thing on the slide. Like, <laughs> 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 so you may have to open your device and turn it on. It's just magnetic, so you can just pop it open. So what you're seeing up here is what the teachers would see. And you see the smiley faces of what people are looking at. In so the turn it on. Wait, top of the device. I know it's not an iPhone. And then swipe up from the bottom. And then you're looking for an orange flag. So if it says connecting, it's connecting. Yep. So you, need yep. you want it to say connecting. Or Hopefully it's going to come up. Yeah, I do, but it's not going to be Oh my god, are inside So you're inside the International Space Station here, which is kind of hard to get us to get a bus to go there. Okay, so actually our first graders just went to the planetarium and they're having science day on Friday. So we're going to bust this kit out. Actually, one of the teachers has been trained on how to do this, and she's going to do it herself now. And she's gonna take the kids to the International Space Station and then we'll show you just a couple scenes from another one, which is uh, some planets. So you can see the entire, our solar system. So, also you can use, the, uh, on the teacher end, you can highlight a particular part, part by putting a squiggle on the page and people should be able to see that. Hey, take a look at, at that part there. The nice part about having some of these things up there is that the teachers can help guide drawing attention to parts in the virtual reality experiment. Oh. <laughs> so if I push a button, it actually draws atten attention. That's their dining table. <laughs> Um, and it should sh show you a little spot on the thing in it. So it should give you a little arrow pointing you to a particular thing. So you might have to move your head around to see it. <laughs> so, over where it's pointing now is where their camera lenses. It's fun to watch the kids do this because they start walking around. Yeah. So we do have to have some safety protocols with the kids, uh, reminding them, hey, um, you, you know, let's have two hands on the on the viewers. Let's make sure that we're trying to stay put because. They might start running into each other if they're not paying attention to where they're going. We have the same problems in the hallways with their students anyway. They're, but they might be looking at it, their phone and texting and walking at the same time. It's Mr. Ferris, no different. Are you texting right now? Uh, no, no, I'm just looking at all the different options. Sorry. Uh, do you want me to switch uh, to uh, the other simulation video? Of this slide? Sorry, I was talking. Yes. Yeah, 
Oh, yeah. That's, that's all. That's all. All right. So, you know, every day in the district, I'm really using it a lot with elementary right now. Yeah. But, yeah. Any teacher in the entire district. All right. So, now I am putting you guys up into the solar system. And in here, we can look at uh, here's uh, pointing us off to the Milky Way. And you guys are picking this up. At, at a lightning pace here, you're finding your way to find the Milky Way. Um, the nice part about Google Expeditions is it gives us a script on the side here about what Google has written. Uh, those, these are curated by uh, by many different uh, parts. Uh, sorry, many different uh, museums and whatnot around the the planet here, giving us the best information and. Hopefully, better script writing than what I can do on the cuff right now. So there, we've got the sun. It will show us where Mercury is, and we can move on through to see. Is it like the starship? Why got starship? How did I get mine into this? Where did you find the sun? This was like this moon through there. Sometimes it's uh they go a little And so in that case you can always take the phone out and see it like Art is seeing it right now. So if kids do get motion sick, yep. or it's more of stuff in adults that get motion sick. Which kids see fine. Which more it's, more the, it's more the adults that get like motion sickness. Kids so. seem fine. Like they're resilient. Do we have another headset uh, that's working? Oh. This one's being a little bit grumpy. I don't Betty, are you on Pluto? So, I don't I'm, huh? on, I'm on Saturn. <laughs> and then there's also <laughs> somewhere you move over as Saturn. <laughs> so, um, are there any questions that you have about virtual reality and how it's being deployed around the district? One of the really nice things is they can take them like to Egypt, they can take them into, you know, the Amazon, they can take them to these places that they wouldn't normally get to see. So how many of these do you have? We have a 30 pack. One kit with 30 in. Yep. And we're sharing that between the three of the four buildings at the moment. And what does uh, an individual one cost approximately? The entire kit was roughly ten thousand dollars. You can buy these for any phone, but our problem was like the phones to put in the devices aren't cheap, and our cheapest route was to purchase a kit through Best Buy. So that's what we ended up doing. So, I mean, we have seen other districts uh, using iPod Touches as the device inside of it, but it gives you a smaller display. Um, the These uh, particular tablets are made by, I think they're with Samsung's? Yeah. Can't remember. Um, but they give us a little bit bigger screen size um, uh, to get us moving along. So, when you bought the package that had all of these viewers, yep. do you do you get the program with all these things, the rainforest, the earth, the whatever? Yes, yeah, this just is a free program. No, free? yep, it's a free program that anybody could use whether or not it was, you so know. If you wanted to use this at home tonight with your own children, yep, all you yeah, need is a, yep, a smartphone just, and the Google app, Expeditions app. Um, you might want some type of viewer. I've seen the, the viewers themselves for about $5 at Walmart. And they all started out as like cardboard from Google. Yeah. yeah. It's so crazy to think. Could wearing these be dangerous for like a child who might have a wandering eye issue or or be prone to you know being cross-eyed or something? Obviously, there's always a safety concern with any technology in a school. But some of the things we remind students is to be aware, be mindful of how they're feeling at the moment. If they are feeling dizzy, to sit down, take the viewer off their eyes. Um, we're and not, if we we're not that case, them we would heads. certainly research it more and find out if it was appropriate for that child. And there's a, like a recommended age. Well, you see, uh, start, yeah. start, way back here, though, is that they wouldn't want to use it with four patients. Yeah. 
Yeah, my limit is end of first grade and up. Gorgeous. And for very short times. I wouldn't spend an hour looking at things on VR. Although there is also a Discovery Channel app on them where you can be like immersed in video. So Shark Week, there were all these Shark Week programs. Now we're not only talking here as well about, um, we're not talking about just science and um, going into space. There are also many uh, art galleries that are, uh, that are placed within the Google Expeditions uh, application. You can pretty much pull up almost every painting that that's in the Louvre um, through, the, through the system. So, and you can get in much, much closer to the painting than what you could actually do if you were there in person. You can actually see the paint tracks in detail if you wanted to. That's cool. You can also go and use the Google Earth app as a VR. So you can go anywhere in the world and, well, not anywhere, but many places in the world and view what it would be like to be there. Many um, places our students probably will never go. And have the, has the 360 yeah. capability. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and street view to move around. Yep. Um, that, I believe, is uh, a lot there's, 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 there's different apps. Oh, okay. that, that there's different apps that you said what we're doing right, right now. Oh, okay. the 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 yeah. Some yeah. of them the actually have an adjustment in here for the the two lenses, the lenses okay. down the middle as this well. This is awesome. Yeah, they are um, nice. Another example, at the high school, they went to the National Mall mm -hmm. using the Smithsonian prints and that sort of thing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And when Patty was up there, she was using it with third graders doing a VR on bridges because they had just studied structural bridges. So as she went through, they were naming off the features of the bridges and what types they were. So it was a really cool way to review while seeing actual bridges in three dimensions. And I'm currently working on uh, expedition with uh, seventh grade for the Industrial Revolution. So we're going back in time. Can't exactly take a bus back in time until they make that. That is awesome. And the, the, the expeditions are just continuing to grow. It's a crowdsourced thing. I, was, I just came from the Google conference and there's actually schools that are going out to local businesses with their 360 camera and taking shots and they have a whole website so it's it's just going to keep growing and growing for more opportunity so it's not something that's like you know has an end in sight can you show moving videos on here yes it, it's all on the app like the expedition is like what you just saw okay but and what is the app well the app that we're using is google expedition but there's other apps, like there's a cell app that would just be looking at cells. And I mean, okay. it's kind of like the sky's the limit for what you can find. And there are op opportunities for students to build their own tours through right. Google Tour Builder, yeah. um, where they can actually start creating stuff, the stuff about maybe we'll pack a chain of lakes and we could actually have them out there building a, a, a tour for maybe our tours and, uh, in our local community. It really depends on how far do we want to run with this, uh, this technology. Can you make your own tours? Yes. yes. Can yep. Students make them? Yeah. Yep. So the conference again that I was at, they have like a maple syrup tour that the school district put together because maybe they can, always can't get out there. Heritage Hill in Green Bay, they went and they did 360 shots of this and made a tour of it. Um, the cranberry bogs. So they created that. So do we have that equipment right now? We do not. No. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's just really a matter of having a camera that does the 360 shot. And you could even do it with your phone. I'm sure you've seen people, mm -hmm. or on Facebook, you see yeah. the photos where, so you, you can do it, it's just the quality. If you want the high quality, if you have the camera, you press the button, walk out of the room, and it shoots it. Download it to Google, and then with the tour creator, you can build your own. And it is something that we are investigating. It's just finding the right, the best model for the buck. Yep. And I went on maternity leave in December before I could ask our PTG for three cameras. My plan was one really high quality one and then two lower quality ones for students to check out and take like when they go on vacation. So when they come back, we can see what they saw. So that's, I need to get back on that in we the next to, month. We'd also have to make sure that we the school appropriate that we should Correct. see what they saw. Right. Um, <laughs> And I know no one concern that. Um, that I heard about was if we're creating these tours like the Heritage Hill, well then are we still going to take our kids to Heritage Hill and do those experiences? And <coughs> yes, we would, but it's a great like 
pre, let's mm -hmm. talk about it, let's look at it, and then you go and you see it, and then you can pull it up again and have post discussion. So. And we did that last year with fourth grade before they went to the Capitol in Madison. We, we didn't have these yet, so we just did it on um, iPads, which was fine, and they got to see the Capitol, and many of them, most of them, had never been there. So it was really neat for them to be able to experience that before actually experiencing I see students standing up while they were using it yeah, and yeah. walking around? No, we wouldn't walk around. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I instruct them to stand this far away from each other and stand in one spot with but two hands can, on the device. They can turn around. Right? Yes, yeah. up, up and down. And if you know you have a kid that struggles with something, you know, give them a swivel chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or if you do have that motion sickness, I sit in a swivel chair when I do it with kids. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you for the introduction to the yard. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it is. Excellent focus. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that brings us to the consent agenda. Your computer wants to wait. Should be back. There's a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? I mean, maybe Greg, you can clarify this. I, I see that uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the last one, the C supply contract for next year. Mm -hmm. So our current amount this year is 106,869, and next year's contract is more 195,452. Is some of that being offset by money we're getting from the alternatives? Or no. is it the contract just went up that much? It, it went up. <coughs> And Marine can certainly speak to this, but uh, with the advent of the elementary program, we purchased three seats in that program. And if we, if right. we use them, we've got them. If we don't, then that is calculated at the end. Okay, that, that solves. All right, motion, second. Any other questions? Roll call. Heather. Aye. 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 Yes. Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 I move adjournment to the full session in accordance with this house in section 1925, five parent, one parent, B parent, C and parent F. Considering dismissal, demotion, licensing, or discipline of any public employee or person licensed by a board or commission for the investigation of charges against such a person, or considering the grant or denial of tenure for a university faculty member and the taking of formal action on any such matter. Provided that the faculty member or public employee or person license is given actual notice of any evidentiary hearing, which may be held prior to final action being taken, and of any meeting at which final action may be taken, the notice shall contain a statement that the person has the right to demand that the evidentiary hearing or meeting be held in open session. This paragraph and paragraph parent F do not apply to such evidentiary hearing or meeting where the employee or person license requests that an open session is there. Considering employment, promotion, and compensation of claims evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercise responsibility, considering financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons, preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems or the investigation of charges against specific persons except where Paragraph parent B applies, which, if discussed in public, would like, be likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data or involved in such problems or investigations, specifically to discuss possible preliminary non-renewal and consider recommendations from personnel committee. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion and second. Motion being to adjourn into closed session in accordance with Wisconsin statutes 19.85 red one for in B for in C and for in F. Roll call. Aye. 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 Aye.
four minutes or whatever time you need to break down the camera. You got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs>